Good morning, everyone. It's time to start day two of the Indoor Storage Conference. If you're joining us again from yesterday, thank you for coming back. My name is Grace. I'm with Project APIS M, and I would like to introduce Josette Lewis, the Chief Science Officer at the Almond Board of California, who is going to welcome everybody today. Josette. Thanks, Grace. Uh, well, it's really a pleasure to welcome you to the second day of this online conference. Um, was very impressed last year with the level of participation and the number of questions. Um, and so we're happy that that is an indication of um, interest in, in this technique. Um, very um, happy to work with Project APSM and Washington State University, not only on the research, but through forum like this in the outreach. Um, I always say that uh, the relationship between almonds and honeybees is one designed by nature. There's a lot of evolutionary adaptation that resulted in a really strong biological partnership between these two organisms. And that now extends to the beekeeper grower relationship and organizations um, such as those uh, convening this meeting here today. Those of you who are follow the almond industry, we're going through a very challenging time. Um, for many growers, it's barely profitable, if at all profitable, to grow almonds. Um, hopefully, these are some short-term growing pains having to do with um, record harvests combined with uh, supply chain problems associated with the pandemic. Um, but nonetheless, <clears throat> the almond industry invests in research as a way to help us um, make it through these times to make uh, step changes through use of new technology and practices and sometimes see changes in the way we grow almonds. And I think of this uh, technique that we're here to learn more about today and yesterday as being a sea change within the beekeeping operation side of it, a really fundamentally different way of managing bees and hopefully managing the um, profitability of beekeeping, which has also escalated in price um, alongside uh, the cost of growing almonds. So a shared interest in finding solutions for beekeepers, we know that that will um, pay off in terms of strengthening that relationship between bees and honeybees and the almond tree and beekeepers and almond growers. So with that, I really look forward to a lot of questions and answers from uh, the discussion today. I think this uh, yesterday was a great example of that combination of um, the best of scientific research together with the best of um, practice and experience among the beekeeping community. And so those two things really are at the heart of making those decisions where there are opportunities for step changes or sea changes. So look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you, Josette. The next item on our agenda is uh, part two of the video tour of the Ashurst Bee Company indoor storage facility. So I especially wanna thank the Ashurst and Brian Ashurst for allowing us into their facility, Scott, Hathaway and Sherry Yadow, who shot and produced the video, Dr. Brandon Hopkins, who's featured in the video, and the Almond Board of California, who helped us produce the video. So I'm going to share my screen, and you all here this morning are the first to see this. So let's see. Okay. It's can everybody see that? Let's see. Maybe if yes. one of, yep, okay, great. <laughs> All right, here we go. My name is uh, Brian Ashurst, and uh, I'm in Southern California in the Imperial Valley. Run bees down here, and I have a family that's also into the bee business. In 2018, we had 100 years as a family. They were primarily honey producers then. That's all they really did. And in, in the Imperial Valley, you could actually make a decent crop back then. It's really been since the mite, the farming practices have changed, got more monoculture, and uh, the fallowing of water. You don't make the honey like you used to. 
But a funny thing happened. A farmer down here noticed that he was making more seed wherever the bees were. So he's the one who said, hey, why don't you put me some more bees out here? Let's see what happens. And my grandpa was pretty, he was a wheeler dealer, and he figured out, hey, there's a service to be done here. And so he started pollination services. And that's how we got into the pollination side of it. We run 25,000, 26. And then you put the whole family together, there's like 50 something. So the Imperial Valley here in Southern California, it's a desert, gets very hot during the summer. You know, it's 115, 118 degree days. We have to shade all our bees to keep them from melting down. That and just for the help for themselves, they need to be able to work in this environment. We lose bees every year to an overheating issue. They're very conscious of the heat and what it does to the bees. The lowest they'll get in brood frames is a couple frames in December. And that's when they kind of take their, their winter break. It's the slowest they ever get. But no, we're never broodless. Feed is, happens all year long. We never stop feeding. We sub all through the winter. And then the varroa pressure is always there because we always have brood. So we have to be careful of that. Stay on top of it. Do you know of anybody else in this similar climate that also uses indoor storage as a beekeeper? I don't know anybody who's doing it. I know some guys talked about it at one point, but nobody's doing it. We use it for a lot of things. We use it in the, this time of year, the, the fall, for the brood break. As the bees come back from Montana, the trucks go straight into the room so we can pull all the nets and everything off in the daylight. Almond time, everything comes into the warehouse, loaded on a trailer, put inside the call room. As soon as it's dark, the truck's hooked up and gone. It's on the road. We save, we save time on the road. We save time, you know, all that. Then the spring, all the packages, all that work is done in here. Later in the spring, they come back, they get supered. The pa those packages now, they're ready to be supered. Uh, we pull honey in here because it's 115 outside. Bring them in here where it's a lot cooler. So we've done all that. And then back to the brood break again. So now we're pretty much, there's only a few breaks in the year where it's not running. So right now they're in there uh, to force them to shut down. We need them to kind of go into a winter mode. The idea being that the mite wants to lay the egg under the cap of the cell. But if there's no cell that's capped, then she can't lay her egg. So we're breaking that brood cycle to force the mite to kind of be in the same boat. She can't propagate either. That way we treat right when they come out, hoping to get every phoretic mite on the outside thereby cleaning the hive. It's like a reset for the hive. Now the hive basically starts all back over. We have a steel structure building with uh, insulated panels, concrete floors, drainage. Uh, we gotta, gotta clean the room and keep it clean. Uh, all the water, the condensation is run outside. You don't want the floors getting all wet with condensations. All the doors are insulated. Uh, you know, it's not airtight. We don't worry too much about CO2. The air quality goes down. You're about at 17% uh, in there while you're in there. You can feel it in your lungs when you're in there, but bees don't seem to bother them one bit. So this is going to be the north room. Let me move this out of the way. Yeah, you can feel it uh, like the the breath, you know, I mean, I can feel that there's less oxygen in the room right now. No, it'll pull the oxygen out. If this was even full, it'd be, go inside there, it's even worse probably. It's like you're at an altitude. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, four rooms and we compartmentalize the rooms that way. If we don't need a room, we don't have to use it. If there's an incident where one of the units messes up, we can just open the doors and bring cold air in from an, another room. When we go to move them out, we can shut a door. So we don't have to worry about heating up a room that doesn't need to be heated up. I mean, here you can see the fans and you can feel all that refrigeration, but these ones have their own. So yeah. each of these bays have... There's fans and stuff up there. They're up there in the top. Okay. Each room has its own system, independent of the other. Yeah. And now I understand what you mean by it. You can use the refrigeration from this room to help cool these rooms, but you can also shut it down to get the loads out. Yeah, because when you open a door, pulls all that air out. So we shut all that, so we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. But I like them open just to, for everything to work together. There's uh, 700 in here now, 750. 
We could actually put more, but our biggest problem is it's hot. You put too many, the uh, tonnage can't keep up. Yeah, yeah. You know? But when we can really load it, oh yeah, you can put 1,000, 1,100. And here, and is this one the same size? Same size. Uh, we figure you can put 36 colonies for one horsepower. So in our rooms, you know, we have a 30 horsepower room, a 26, 22, and a 20. And uh, so we load them accordingly to whatever that room can handle. Uh, in August, when it's 115 degrees, later in the year, you can put more of these because uh, you're not fighting the outdoors. The reason you need so much horsepower is because you have to overcome the bees. You have to, the bees, you have to defeat them and thinking, hey, it's, I, I, we can warm this place up. As soon as they realize, okay, forget it. It's, it's cold. We're not going to beat it. We're going to cluster. Now you can keep it down. But if they think they can warm it up, they keep trying to warm it up. So you want more horsepower than, than is actually required to keep them cold. And then we monitor uh, the phone. All the rooms are connected to my phone. I can tell you the temperature right now. And so alarm goes off, you know, lets you know, hey, you got a room that's kind of heating up so you can react to it. So this is the north room, it's 40. The west, 43, 40, 43 and a half. And then uh, the middle right here, 41. Are there special considerations for like frosting up? Do you have issues with these things freezing yeah. up and defrost cycles and all that? Right, because in the summer they're working so much to keep it cool. We actually have timers on them to shut them down. They have to shut down so we can keep them to get the head pressure off. Uh, we keep an eye on uh, refrigeration units themselves just to make sure nothing's icing up. No, nothing's going wrong in that sense. Anything that happens, we react to it. We'll go in the room, clean the pans out if we have to. If the pan gets clogged, and it does, with bees, water can't run off, the ice is out. I'm out here every day just taking a look. Been many a time full of bees in there. I'm in there cleaning a pan up on a ladder. Gotta do it. <laughs> we do a maintenance between every cycle of, of, of bees that go in the room. Uh, go drop all the pans, clean everything up, because you don't want anything to happen while they're in there. Power is a consideration for those of you considering it. Um, you got to have enough power. It takes a lot of power to run these. Even the guys who built it had to learn some stuff on how, because this was a little bit unique for them. They build coolers for produce, but never anything like this, where they're having to fight the, the bees. And so we went to 400 amp service, um, and that is more efficient and uh, saves us some money. And uh, the units work way better. So from here on out, that's all I would do. You know, power bills are high, but the savings comes in on the uh, later on. One, your, your help isn't having to work bees for three weeks at least. That saves at least one feeding. That saves you some money. Plus the cleanup happens. You're not feeding bees that are gonna die anyway. You offset the power bill with some savings on the work side of things. <laughs> All right, so as I mentioned, that video has never before been seen, um, and it will be posted on the Project APSM YouTube channel later, and hopefully the quality came through okay, but you can always watch it again. I think there's lots of interesting details in there about how these facilities are managed, and of course, a lot of our topics today are going to get into some more detail about these indoor storage facilities um, and how to use them. So we're running just slightly ahead of schedule. Before we jump to our next speaker, I am going to try a few polls again. So bear with me. These questions are really valuable to us and researchers that we work with um, to get your feedback. So let's try this again. Okay, so you might recognize this question from yesterday. We'll just start out with that. Mm 
give about a minute to respond. Looks like we have a mix here today of commercial beekeepers, hobbyists and sideline beekeepers and researchers. Okay, great. And just so you guys can see who all you're attending here with today. And I have another poll question. So which of the following statements best fits your current status with respect to indoor storage? Just wait on a, a few more responses. I see a few more answers coming in. Hi, Ellie. Hey, how's it going? All right, we'll end this poll. And I think I'm sharing the results. So can you can you see these, Ellie? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so thank you all for answering those. We'll have two more poll questions later today. And since our next speaker is here. I will introduce her. I'd like to welcome Ellie Symes, CEO of the B Corp. Today, she's going to be sharing with us some recent updates on new technology with indoor storage and hive grading. So welcome, Ellie, and um, please take the floor. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks for everybody for joining. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm sorry if my voice gets out, gives out. I'm actually getting over COVID, so I'm going to try to make it through. This will definitely be the most I've talked uh, in days. Uh, so I'm here to present what we've been doing with cold storage testing with commercial beekeepers. Our, our main product that we use helps uses infrared imagery and data analytics to predict the size of the colony inside the hive, which allows growers and beekeepers to measure pollination value and ensure best pricing for pollination. We capture the image with a camera that we source through a hardware partner, and our mobile app is used to tag the images and upload them with the appropriate metadata. The app works completely offline since low cell connectivity is very common uh, in our fields. And the, after the images are uploaded, the images run through our image processing pipeline, and then the colony size is reported back to the users in our app. Our, the technology we built blends biology, thermal physics, data analytics, machine learning, and infrared image analysis to get an accurate prediction on hive size. And our flagship product that's typically used during pollination seasons was built and evaluated by capturing images with Fairfly, then conducting a standard manual industry inspection and comparing both inspection methods against hive weight so colony weight as a control. Um, and that is what we use to validate our model. Um, but we recently started talking to beekeepers about how to bring the technology to their operations. And one of the most popular use cases that we got was using the product in indoor cold storage, which would allow the beekeepers to get a sense of the strength of the colonies at a time when the hives can't be open. 
And beekeepers want to use this for a few different reasons. Uh, they want to use this to forecast for pollination, gain a peace of mind during cold storage, and protect their assets by inspecting hives before and after cold storage. So many beekeepers have been using infrared qualitatively to get an accurate estimate of colony size for years. And ambient dynamics just make it very difficult to get a precise estimate of colony size this way. This is the same hive captured eight hours apart, which visually looks like different sized hives. And our algorithm incorporates the complex ambient conditions that are needed to get an accurate estimate of colony size and is based on years of our research into the thermodynamics and biology of bee behavior at different colony sizes. Before we wanted to start operating the product in cold storage, we first wanted to set up a couple studies to validate whether the product would work in this use case. Um, and typically because hives, as we know, only go in storage about once a year, the timing of the study can be very difficult. So once we learned about this use case, we did work with beekeepers over the winter last year and assess the colonies that were already placed in cold storage to ensure the product hardware and software could be used and rule out any obvious reasons that the model wouldn't be accurate in this use case. We compared the thermal distributions from indoor hives to our data set uh, from outdoor colonies and didn't find significant differences between the two. These images were also assessed images also uh, passed the accuracy test that we had available. And then from a feasibility standpoint, we found that taking infrared images and indoor cold storage is doable, but the white headlamps we were using in this picture on the right woke the BAs, that was a problem, um, but red light didn't cause this problem. And in addition, another feasibility outcome we learned from this testing was some of the stacks are very difficult to access and image. So the last thing we were interested in looking at on these tests last year were how many hives you could fit in one image, as we knew that some hives would be too small in the image for the mod model to maintain its accuracy. And we've determined that a four by four grid is a safe range for hives. And I have some diff additional information on these tests that we ran. So we didn't find any evidence against using Verify in last year's study um, in this use case. But because of this timing, we didn't have the manuals from the fall. Uh, but we did a visual validation, uh, which does produce limited results, but allowed us to get a sense of the accuracy. We also compared the thermal distributions and other features of the indoor images to our outdoor data, and that matched up very well. And overall, the model was about 67% accurate at classifying the hives as weak or strong. And we learned that straight on larger hives did better based on our visual assessment and hives taken at that extreme angle that were very small were responsible for the majority of the errors. And this image shows the information loss that we assessed as pixel size decreases across the hive which is the same as the hive being smaller in the image and taking up fewer pixels. And from these assessments, we were able to determine that a four by four grid is the safest to maintain model accuracy. Now the model that actually picks the hive in the image didn't do great on the stack setting. So we knew we needed to make updates to the model to perform better on this stacked hive setup. The model that we had at the time really had been trained on and optimized on finding pallets in outdoor settings. So we identified a few step, a few next steps for this upcoming fall. We wanted to get the accuracy test done with manuals and line up that timing. We wanted to train our model to work in red light segmentation so you don't have to use a white light headlamp that really isn't feasible for the setting. We also wanted to continue to work with more beekeepers and cold storage operators to determine the best way to take the images and get around these stacks of pallets and line up additional trials. So we recently just concluded a study with Hivetech Solutions and their MICA units 
Uh, manual inspections were conducted about a month before placing them in cold storage. We had plans to collect the manuals closer to placing the hives in cold storage, but this period of time is difficult and the weather just prevented us from being able to open the hives closer to it. But the inspections that were done were a detailed frame by frame assessment and the images were taken of the hives outside of the units and then right after they had been placed in the units, which has allowed us to also compare the outdoor results to the indoor results, which can actually help with the gap of time between manuals and verify images. We just did the study a couple of weeks ago and the manuals track pretty closely with the verify inspections, which makes sense. There is some variation when you factor in the accuracy of manual inspection, the variation in Verify, and then the amount of time between the manual assessment and Verify images. Hives three and nine are outliers that we're investigating. Um, we're typically, we certify our accuracy based on an average basis to smooth out those variations. And for the hives where we had manuals, inside images and outside images, that inside frame count average was eight and the manuals were nine. Uh, which pretty closely matches up. The indoor images also predicted very similar to the outdoor images as well, where pretty much all hives were within two frames of each other. So as with any study, there's definitely limitations to these results. This was a small sample of hives. Again, it's very difficult to um, do these detailed hive assessments that late in the year. Um, the units are small, so the indoor images were exposed to outdoor temperature and sunlight while the images were captured. And then the manuals, as I mentioned, were a few weeks apart from the hives. All of these could have resulted in some of the fluctuations that we've seen to date. Um, so we've got several next steps that we want to do from the results of these. And while we're feeling very good about the accuracy of Verify holding up in indoor environments, we would, want, we would like more data to confirm this. And we also want to determine the best image capture protocols to ensure the images are easy to take and optimize for accuracy. Uh, this is something that we're currently working on and would be happy to work with any additional beekeepers here that are interested in using Verify and cold storage. Certainly, we still have a lot of questions around the best angle for optimized accuracy different setups that different beekeepers see inside these units so that we can best plan how to best take these images. I provided here my contact information for anyone that's looking to get in touch after this conference. I'll also be on a panel later today with Kim from Hive Technologies talking more in depth about new technology uses for indoor cold storage. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity from Project APIS to be able to present today what we've done so far on testing this and I'll be happy to open it up to any questions that you all have. Great, thank you, Ellie. And we do have time for a few questions. If you wanna pop them in the chat or um, as Ellie mentioned, she will be joining us in the panel later today. So I'll just pause here for a second if anyone has any questions for Ellie. Um, otherwise, we will move to a few more polls and see if our next speaker is ready. Grace, uh, I see Gloria's hand. Gloria, go ahead. Oh, um, yes, thank you. Let me see if I can... Uh, un can we unmute Gloria? I believe so. Yep, yeah. okay. Gloria, go ahead and try now. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. All right, Ellie, thank you for that terrific presentation. It's so interesting. Uh, um, do you have any data on colonies before they went into cold storage and after they came out of cold storage, what the differences in those colony sizes are? Can you comment on that, please? We, uh, that's a great question, Gloria. We don't yet. We'd love to work with folks that want to study and assess that. I know a big thing, folks want to understand is how the colonies grow during cold storage. That's something that Kim and I have talked a lot about, um, as well as 
uh, beekeepers want a good understanding, a hive coming out of cold storage, what that frame strength is going to be in the field. So we'd love to set up studies with folks that want to look at that over a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. So far, we've really just done these feasibility studies, accuracy studies to see if we can we can do it. We can take the images in the field. And now that in the cold storage, and now that we know that we can, we have the opportunity to do those types of studies, which I'd love to do. Yeah, I mean, that that would be great to, to get a colony size right before they're ready to go out the door. Because, you know, I, I realize measurements that we take, the colonies are open and things are flying all over the place. So there's error involved, but you could get that those counts very, very accurate or probably better than what we're doing. Definitely. And I think the other thing that especially commercial beekeepers are interested in is they want to protect their assets while they're in cold storage. So knowing even before and after helps protect them to ensure that they came out at least a similar frame strength that they went in, um, that the cold storage units didn't drastically impact the health of the hive, which is, I think, really important to make beekeepers feel more comfortable using and adapting to cold storage uh, over wintering too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Brandon's got a question here. Uh, yeah, Brandon asks, how does the pic picture from the camera get to the phone app? Is it Bluetooth? Is the assessment of strength readout in real time? That's a great question, Brandon, and good to see you here. Um, Right now, the cameras connect to the phone via a local Wi-Fi. So that doesn't mean that you need an actual Wi-Fi in the building or cell connection. The phone actually sets up a local Wi-Fi connection directly to the camera. So it doesn't require any cell or internet connectivity, but that's how the two are linked. So it's similar to Bluetooth. Um, it has a longer range, typically it's a little bit more reliable around uh, objects. And that's how we sync them to the images. Um, right now, actually, we do have our first version of instant predictions out. Uh, this was another use case that beekeepers really wanted to see. Um, right now, it does it on a basically a site by site basis. And you can set up sites to be, um, you know, specific stacks in a cold storage unit, specific units um, where it will output the frame strength. That first version though does require internet connection to run through the image processing and pull back down. But our team right now is working on fully real-time instant predictions all done on the device. So on the phone, so that beekeepers can actually be marking hives as they go and inspect, inspect the colonies. We are hoping to have that done uh, here this pollination season, but it has been really complex to adapt these models to be used on a small cell cellular device. Uh, but when that's ready, I think that's gonna allow any beekeeper to use it. But currently we can do real-time assessments on a site basis for beekeepers that have cell connection where they're taking the images. Thank you, Ellie. And next, I think I wanna go to George who has his hand up. So George, if you could unmute, if you'd like to ask your question. How about now? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, um, this isn't really a question, it's more, but I, I'd like to get a response. Um, uh, in reality, there are a lot of things that can happen to hives and the viral loads um, are variable and we don't know what they always mean and whatnot. And so, uh, but one of the real things that happens to bees uh, when they have viral loads is that their lifespan is shortened dramatically. So sometimes colonies will fail in the fall and that would be taken care of by sorting before they went into a building. But there are other times that can happen. And one of them is when they come out of the building, you'll have something that you're expecting and may even look good. And in a period of two weeks, it's not any good anymore. I was wondering how, you know, in just what's your response to that? How could beekeepers help to manage and expect that or predict it or deal with it with your technology? That's a great question, George. And you're absolutely right. Um, I This group would know, I forget which group came out with the study in the last couple of weeks that showed that on average, the actual worker bee life cycle is 
shorter than it was a decade ago, which was pretty groundbreaking um, and pretty troubling, I think, for beekeepers that really were relying on that. You know, when I started beekeeping, it was a 21 day rule of thumb, and now it can be as short as 17 day uh, life cycle. For us, I think the commercial beekeepers that are using the technology are actually using this to get an early indication for their growers of the strength of the colony that they're going to be able to send. They're also using this on trucks, imaging the hives on trucks to ensure, you know, while they're shipping anything that's happening during that life cycle, they're tracking the strength of the colonies to ensure they make grade. Uh, typically, all of, let's say this happens, George, let's say, um, the hives come out of cold storage looking really great. They even make it through trucking looking great. And typically it's not very feasible for the beekeeper all the time to go through all of the colonies um, that they're placing in the orchards. They might be moving on to another grower. Usually we're working with our growers, interpreting the results to help them understand that, you know, a seven and a half ring colony is gonna be good to go. If you're imaging before bloom even starts, that's gonna be really good to go and helping them understand what these strength numbers mean at the time that they're imaging. And then all of our growers are typically working with the beekeeper to see if they have additional hives they can bring out, if we need to do additional assessments, if they wanna assess a little bit later in bloom. Um, we've definitely been really taking it to an importance for us to help educate growers on what frame strength means at certain times and how difficult it is to have an eight frame average in the fields come almond season. Um, so you're exactly right. I mean, I think life cycle is just one of the many challenges beekeepers are facing this time of year. Um, making it easier to go through them and sort them with Bearfly, I think helps. We don't have to open the hives, so you're not breaking that hive seal and getting a check on the quality of the hives. But really, I think for us, we've taken it on upon ourselves to also educate growers once those hives hit the field to make sure that they're comfortable with different strength levels because we work with beekeepers. We know how difficult it is. Thank you, Ellie. And we still have a little bit of time. So next I wanna go to Jason Miller who had his hand up and then we have just a few questions in the chat. So Jason? Yeah, um, hey, great presentation. I, I'm curious what you've done as far as honey um, blocking the thermal image of, of strong colonies. That's something when we experimented with this technology a few years back, um, we found it very hard to correlate the hive strength uh, just based on how much honey was blocking the thermal image because it was so thermally dense. So what progress have you made there and how much of an issue have you found that to be? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So uh, we kept capture an image looking down the frames. So you're looking at the side of the colony. Um, when you image on the side, when you're basically looking at the full frame of honey on the outside of the frame, you're never going to be able to get an accurate estimate. You're exactly right. The thermodynamics of that honey really insulates the hive and makes it very difficult to see the population of the bees inside. We found that when we're looking down the frames, you're actually able to much more accurately get a picture of the colony size inside the hive. We've tested all sorts of setups inside the hive. Um, insulation, plastic frames versus wood frames, hive feeders, how much honey is in the box, how much brood is in the box. And we've been able to correlate our populations under all of those use cases. So we found that typically when you're just having the honey on the side and it's a small part of the image, um, it you can still get an accurate picture of the colony side inside of the hive. That honey doesn't impact the thermal image when you're looking down the frames, but certainly the side of the colony, it can't be done. Uh, and so when we're doing our training, if folks are taking images of themselves, that's really an important part of our training is helping them understand what side of the palette to take the images on uh, because it's, if it's a side of the box and you're hitting that feeder or the honey, it's it's not going to be accurate. Great. Thank you, Ellie. And looking to the Q&A, I see um, William Michael, who is a researcher at the USDA lab in Tucson, <laughs> says, Hi, Ellie. We have 18 hives in our experimental cold storage unit. All hives assessed about two weeks before storage. 
monitoring temperature and CO2 in cold storage, you are all welcome to come take pictures. So I'm just thanks, William. I appreciate connection. it. That's awesome. I appreciate it, William. I'll reach out. And then a question from Ian Stepler. I find the variability of heat signature sure varies between hive to hive. It provi sure provides information on survivor survivability, but I can't seem to predict the hive size well at all. Some hives are hot, some hives are cold. What would cause this? Brooding, not brooding, grooming, not grooming. Are you, I think this question is when you're using the camera qualitatively to look at the hives. Maybe Ian can um, type a follow-up, but. I'm definitely gonna go with that assumption here first uh, while they're responding. You're definitely right. And that's you know why we wanted to start building this product years ago. We definitely saw that variation ourselves. Um, these are of course stationary hives, but this was early on when we did our assessment. We actually looked at the thermal signatures over time. We took images every 30 minutes to look at how those changed. And we found that the hive can look very different. Uh, this hive on the left, if I saw that in a cold storage unit, I would think that is a pretty good to go hive. Uh, the hive on the right looks pretty weak. And even if you're trying to get a sense of where the center of the cluster is, you can't really pick it out from either of these images, which in fact is pretty common. Um, certainly that was a big aspect on why we wanted to do this quantitatively. Um, and what I mean when I say we modeled the physics of the hive, and I think this gets at Brandon's question a little bit as well, um, we actually brought on uh, a person, he's got a PhD in physics and he's done years of research into neutrinos to model the thermodynamics of bees inside of the colony. Um, and then we were able to match this model with real hive temperature assessment. So we basically placed the temperature sensors in many different places throughout the hive to validate that under these different ambient conditions, our physics model was accurately estimating those temperatures. From there, we're able to predict what the temperature on the surface wall needs to be to result in that indoor temperature. So it's very complex. It took us three years to get the product to a level where it's accurate enough to be used commercially. And you guys can see from this assessment, we still wanna do more research on cold storage. Um, this is a very difficult product to build. We built it with um, over a million dollars of National Science Foundation funding. Um, and it's definitely allowed us to start using this. Um, for us right now, uh, hive by hive accuracy is still something that we are continuing to improve upon. We're almost there. Uh, in warm weather conditions, we are more accurate than manual inspections. And we are so close to being there in cold climate on every single individual hive which I'm excited about. I think that really opens up so many additional use cases for beekeepers. But now they're using basically a pallet level average, a site level average, a hive stack average, which really is what the growers are looking for. They're looking for an average basis. Um, and for beekeepers, that definitely helps accomplish a lot of use cases while we finalize this last piece of our product. Great, thank you, Ellie. And I see a question in the chat about the use of drones inside storage buildings. I think I wanna save that one for the panel so that we oh. can have multiple people weigh in. And then from Gloria, can you discern brood areas in a colony based on temperature? Sorry, I thought you were asking Gloria that question. Oh, no. <laughs> um, uh, we don't use, I think if we were using internal sensors, we could um, probably get pretty close. Uh, we don't use internal sensors. We're just using this external thermal picture. Um, we have not tested whether we can accurately predict brood frames. We have the data to test whether we could. I can certainly, I will certainly add it to our roadmap to test whether we can build a model to predict that, because I think that would be interesting, would certainly have use cases for beekeepers. 
So it's a really good idea. We've we've done the assessments. We have that data labeled, uh, and would just be a matter of seeing where it's at to date. So, um, Gloria, I could get back to you on that one too. In a similar vein, we have um, Ian is asking if you can determine varroa infected colonies just from the heat signature. And I'm sure he's not the only person who is wondering about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, we haven't, so unfortunately, unlike brood frames, we don't have the, we've not done typically varroa counts when we've done our assessments. So we would need to do additional studies to be able to tell that. Um, frankly, I don't think thermal is the best way to automatically detect uh, varroa populations. Um, I've got some theories about audio and some other analysis that could be done, other sensors that could be used for that. Uh, funny story, our NSF grant was actually originally used for varroa level detection, originally was meant for that. We interviewed commercial beekeepers and we learned that because most commercial beekeepers are so labor constrained, it didn't really help on the commercial scale to tell them the varroa levels in their hive um, because they're basically, they need to treat all the hives. At the time it was every six weeks anyway. Um, so even if a varroa, even if a hive didn't have a varroa infestation, they were gonna treat anyway. And so it didn't really help them to tell them the levels of the hive. Now I realize not every beekeeper manages their hive that way. Certainly when I was a hobbyist beekeeper, I did not manage my hives those way, that way. I was definitely doing varroa accounts and treating as needed. Um, so I still think there's an opportunity in the space for that level of assessment. For us, we wanted to focus on pollination, food production, and went away from studying that. But um, I certainly would be happy to chat with you guys. I, I definitely have some good ideas on how it could be done. And I think there's a there's an opportunity for it in the space for us. I don't think we're going to be able to detect it with thermal brood, maybe. Varroa, I doubt we're going to be able to do that with what we're doing, um, just based on what I know about the bee biology of the hive and how they react to Varroa. That's great insight. Thank you, Ellie. And I think we'll start to transition to our next speaker. Um, but I just want to ask before you go, Ellie, if you could flash your contact information one more time. And should I just drop it in the chat? That would that would be wonderful. Okay, I will do that. I've lost my mouse here for a second. And I'll just say George Hansen says, as an artist, I am very interested in your images. May I get some from you to use in my paintings? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, George. I'll drop my contact inf information in the chat and then feel free to uh, to reach out to me. Thank so you. So it Ellie. looks like I can just send it to the right, hosts and, and panelists. We will. Um, I'll just share it again here real quick. That'd be great. Thank you. Here we go. Perfect. Thank you, Thank Ellie. You. And Thank we you. Will... Are... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I just want to say I really appreciate the opportunity to present and share what we've been doing. The questions were wonderful. Uh, really uh, appreciate the engagement here. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all in a little bit here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And just before we swap over to um, our talk with Dr. Brittany Goodrich, I have a couple more polls for the audience. So let's see. Take this down. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Ellie. All right, let me launch this poll. Hopefully, everyone can see that. All right. Hi, Brittany. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. And we're just going to give a minute for everyone to answer this poll question. And then if oh, you're ready, Brittany, we can start with you at, at any time. I can okay. see your slides. That's great. All right. Awesome. So you want me to go now or give them a few let's, 
just give one more minute for this poll question. Okay. So what is the top hurdle to your operation to adopt indoor storage? And looks like we've had about 70% of folks answer. So I'll just give a few more seconds. Okay, great. So I'm gonna end that poll and I'll share the results briefly. All right, thank you everyone for taking the time to answer that. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brittany Goodrich, who's a researcher and professor at the University of California, Davis. Today, she's gonna to be talking with us about to buy or rent indoor economic storage, um, indoor storage economics and trends. So um, with that, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Brittany. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's good to be here today. So I, I've titled this Economic Considerations for Indoor Storage, a work in progress. So the way I'm gonna go about this today, I can get, okay. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of different ideas here, but this is largely something that I'm still working on and thinking about. So basically, we're going to first talk about uh, if you're a beekeeper considering renting indoor storage space from someone else. Uh, and then I'm going to ask what I got wrong in this analysis. And then I'll also talk about um, sort of thinking about the investment analysis of building your own indoor storage facility. And again, I'm going to ask for a lot of discussion and, and feedback um, when when thinking about these issues. Um, as I said, it's still a work in progress. So the first thing that we're going to go over is um, thinking through making a decision about uh, renting indoor storage space for your colonies. So I'm pretending I'm a beekeeper that has 5,000 hives uh, that I'm considering renting space for. Um, so we're going to use this partial budget analysis framework to think through this decision. So on the left hand side, we're going to put any additional additional costs or reduced revenue. Um, so all of the bad things on the right hand side, we're uh, putting additional revenue and any reduced costs from adopting this practice. So all of the good things on the right. So um, let's just walk through uh, how I'm thinking about this. So uh, first off, uh, I'll, we'll talk about the additional costs of uh, renting that indoor storage space. So I'm assuming uh, I'm going to have to pay $7 a hive to rent out this storage space from someone. Um, basically, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, this storage space is not going to be necessarily um, in the most convenient spot. So I'm going to have to, you know, load and unload my colonies an additional time and I'm going to have to drive a little bit out of out of the way um, to get to this indoor storage space so I've accounted for the cost of of loading and unloading the colonies um, additional mileage so 12 truckloads at 200 miles at four dollars a mile for shipping those colonies extra um, and then we're also going to have to go through those colonies uh, an additional time and grade them before putting them into storage. So that's an, another additional cost. Um, and this one is one I'm really not sure about uh, five minutes per colony at uh, a labor cost of $22 an hour. So I'd, I'd really be interested in, in how much time you think you spend uh, grading colonies. So we're assuming that um, additional revenue, we're going to think of, about this in terms of, uh, we're gonna decrease our winter losses uh, by putting them in this indoor storage space. So I've assumed um, our winter losses decrease by 2%. Um, and then we're gonna, so basically then we're gonna get an extra $205 per hive for almond pollination. I've kind of, I haven't, assumed that we're going to you know make additional honey or um, I haven't factored in you know costs of replacing those colonies but um, yeah so this is just the a simple um, straightforward way to think about it 
So then we're also going to have reduced costs. Um, so I, I'm not going to feed the colonies as much as I would if they were out in the cold. Um, so I've assumed we're going to feed them two gallons less uh, sugar syrup and two, uh, two pounds or two uh, pollen patties less uh, per colony, um, which adds up at, at the, the costs per unit. Um, and then also I've assumed, you know, labor, we're gonna, we're not feeding those colonies, we're not getting into them. So there's gonna be less uh, labor cost. And I've also put fuel in here as that's definitely a factor, but I, I didn't have, uh, I haven't factored it in just cause it's gonna vary so much uh, based on, you know, where you're located and where all of your your different holding yards are. So I, I put it in there, but just didn't uh, factor it in at this point. <clears throat> so this is what uh, this, you know, with these assumptions, we have uh, additional costs and reduced revenue of about 60,000 or $61,000 uh, and total additional revenue and reduced costs of $110,000, um, which equates to about a, a, a net profit of $9.88 per colony. So that's, um, it, it seems to, to pencil out uh, with all these assumptions, but again, I probably got something wrong. So I'm, I'm anxious to hear about that. Uh, I also wanted to throw, just factor in if, if we don't have those decreased losses and even so the reduced feeding costs are still enough to actually make uh, this make sense. So he, uh, here I'm opening it up now um, to, to hear what I've gotten wrong and, and what am I missing in this uh, simple analysis. Depending on how much I've gotten wrong, uh, I may have to cut it off and, and move on. Uh, but yeah, so anybody have any thoughts or comments? I was just saying it'd be nice to hear from some of the beekeepers on here uh, to know if they're treating for varroa mites or applying any other additional treatments during the, the winter storage when they're outdoors? Yeah, that is something that I had also thought about. Um, and so I'm, yeah, I, I would like to hear folks' opinions on that. I would uh, invite our, our panelists who can unmute themselves if you have comments to do that first and then attendees, if you'd like to speak, just raise your hand and we'll unmute you, so. Brian, Jason, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, Brittany, this is Jason Miller, and and uh, hey, congratulations! I think you did a great, great job. Obviously, those figures, you know, well, hey, I pay five fifty a mile, or you know, we've seen an eight mm -hmm. percent increase in 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 um, or decrease in hive mortality, and mm -hmm. you know, all those numbers can be played with, but but I think your model. Um, is a great model for kind of working through these numbers and then plugging in, you know, in your outfit, um, what, what you're actually experiencing and then, and then working through those numbers. So um, I think, you know, yeah, there's things that are slightly different for us and would be slightly different for everyone, but, uh, but I think it's a, a great model and kind of gives some direction on, on helping people decide, you know, if this makes sense for them. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah, I mean, and I have this right now in like a spreadsheet format, so it might be something that could be useful to put online um, so that people can, you know, take a look at it and, and plug in their own numbers. Uh, so, okay, good to know. Yeah, I agree with Jason. Uh, yeah, and I think some kind of spreadsheet. I mean, I remember from last year, that was a lot of people were kind of asking for like a, is there some kind of tool that we can use like to plug numbers in and so something like that would be exactly I think what some people were asking from last webinar. George you can unmute yourself and Brian you can jump in anytime and then we have Clay attorney after George. Yeah spreadsheet would help but the uh I was just uh, wondering about the reduced amount of pollen substitute uh, while bees uh, during that time period when bees are in a building or they're outside is not a time when we're normally using any pollen substitute. And when they come back out, I would okay. think that they would use it. But I, I don't know. That's probably something that a spreadsheet, a guy could just decide that for themselves and plug it in or take it out. 
Right. Clay, go ahead. I think the labor time might be a little bit too high on the reduced cost. If you have a pallet of okay. four hives, it doesn't take 80 minutes to feed them. You might almost want to flip flop the 20 minutes for the additional cost and five the other way. I'd also like to okay. hear what the prior speakers talked about with their costs. Maybe we could get their costs and you could use that mm -hmm. as an option, an additional cost if she's still available. Yeah, and, I, and that, yeah, that would be great to hear too. The one thing I was thinking is that labor, the 20 minutes per colony, I was assuming, you know, again, it's so variable between operations, but, you know, is mm -hmm. it is it sending a whole crew of people from North Dakota to California to to feed a bunch of bees, you know, so that that labor cost to travel, or are you putting them up in a hotel, right. to stay, you know, to stay in California and work bees for two weeks to feed and to pollen sup them and, you know, pull dead outs and things like that. Um, it's hard to it's hard to say depending on right and what your operations are in the winter. I think Clay I was thinking Ellie, if you're still there. And uh Gloria, go ahead. Could you uh look at your model? Uh, this this is really cool, Brittany. Uh, uh this is so interesting. Uh, could you think about taking your model and and maybe flipping it and say, what kind of um, high feed do I need to, to get to make this profitable for me or profitable over a five-year period or whatever your loan is going to be? Have you, can, you, can you comment on that? Yeah, well, this isn't, this is only looking at rental, like renting space from somebody else. And we can get into more of the investment analysis, but this is certainly um, that that's uh, a way that we could think about this or, you could think about it as if you're looking at primarily winter losses, what is mm -hmm. the winter loss rate that justifies um, doing this? So yeah, there's a lot of different break-even calculations that can be done using this framework as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's really... Um... Okay, so maybe unless Ellie, was Ellie gonna... I'm not sure if she's I don't there or see Ellie. Um, and then okay. I will just read from the chat from Jim McMahon. I treated with oxalic in November and again in the first week of December. And then I think that was it for comments at this time. Okay. So now we'll I'll move on and get into the um more complicated investment analysis part of it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this one, I, it, my figures and numbers could be way off. So looking forward to having a discussion about this, but so what I'm assuming here is that I'm going to build a 10,000 square foot refrigerated storage space where I'm going to put my 5,000 hives, um, and then I'll rent out the other 5,000 space for 5,000 hives to other beekeepers. Um, so then <clears throat> we're looking at a total investment cost of about $150 per square foot, so $1.5 million uh, total. Uh, I've assumed annual utilities of about $400 per square foot. This could be completely off, so looking forward to um, having some suggestions there. And then, so I'm assuming this building is going to have a useful life of 30 years um, and Right now, we're looking at interest rates of about six and a half percent, and I'm assuming that I'm taking out a loan for for ten years on this building. So when we do this, um, we have to think about what our our changes in annual uh, costs are going to be, and then also factor it in into it like a, a longer term net present value. So um, what I've assumed here, just thinking annually. Um, I'm I'm still going to have an additional load and unload of all of my truckloads of of colonies. Um, I'm still going to have to do some additional grading uh, uh, every year for um, putting them in storage, and then 
Also the utilities are gonna be, like I said, I've assumed $4,000 per square foot. So about $40,000 a year um, for operating this building. Uh, I'm gonna decrease winter losses um, by about 5%. Uh, mostly I bumped that number up so that this whole analysis made sense. Uh, <laughs> just because I wanted to, to see, it was about, the break even there was about, I think it was 4%. Um, and I'm gonna get that additional $7 per hive from a, another beekeeper uh, for renting out the additional space. And I'm, of course, I'm assuming the same uh, um, feeding, uh, reduced feeding costs uh, each year. So then what we need to do is plug that into net present value type analysis where we look at and every year we have you know additional those additional revenues we have reduced costs um, and additional costs and then we have our annual loan payment each year and i've assumed in the first year we just make the loan payment we're building this this building but we don't get any um basically there's no changes in that in that first year um but then or in year zero is what I've called it. But then in year one, uh, we start seeing those changes. And so you can see I've highlighted year 10. Uh, once we've paid off that loan, that's the first year that um, we really see a positive um, net present value of our annual returns. Um, but in total, after accounting for the 30 year useful life of this building, uh, the net present value of of this analysis is a, about $150,000. So um, like I said, in this case, it makes sense when you have uh, a lower, I think it, I, I, at that 2% uh, winter loss rate, which I assumed earlier, uh, this actually, the net present value is negative, so it wouldn't make sense. Um, so it, it fluctuates a little bit. So, um, that's the way I'm I'm thinking about this. Uh, and I see people raising their hands already. So I assume I've gotten lots of things wrong. So uh, let's discuss. <laughs> I see um, Kim from Hive Tech Solutions. Kim, if you want to unmute yourself. Sure. Thanks. This is this is a really awesome analysis. A couple of things I might put in two categories or at least account for. There may be some design fees up front for the mechanical and the building costs. Um, mm -hmm. And depending on, you know, for houses, we use about 6% of the total cost, but maybe with these, okay. I, I would use somewhere probably 4 to 3% with this size of building. Um, and then uh, one of the benefits of having your building, you know, on a permanent foundation like that you know, is just depreciation over time. So if you can, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. that might be a really big factor to play into the long-term finances. And then okay. the thing I wanted to bring up was uh, the USDA has a commodity storage loan program. Right mm -hmm. now it's for honey storage and not for honey bees, but I, I believe there is a lobbying effort to get these buildings um, classified so that they would, would be available for those low cost loans, which are somewhere in the 2% range. Right. Okay. Yeah. All really great points. Thank you for that. Sure. Yep. And in the um, Q and A, we have John says an allowance should be made for building maintenance, building cleaning, landscaping, mm -hmm. inflation for utilities. Okay. Yeah. That. Yeah. Definitely makes sense. Um, I didn't think about that, but I've heard folks talk about, yeah, having to clean out all the dead bees on the floor and, and keeping everything clean. So yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I do think uh, the $7 a hive for rental fee is probably a little bit on the low side now and folks on the really? call okay. can weigh in. But I mean, I think that's probably from what I've seen more, more like the, maybe an unrefrigerated building, uh, and maybe they're your buddy or something. I don't know. I, I, yeah. think I, I think I heard this week in Idaho, you know, guys are charging as much as $14 a hive. And so maybe, okay, maybe something more like 10 would be a better average or something, 10 or 12. But... Okay.
Um, yeah, so unless anybody else has anything uh, to add, I put up, I thought folks might be thinking about almond pollination. So I put up the 2022 results from the CSBA pollination uh, fee survey. Oh, it looks like increased, Clay says increased real estate taxes and revenue from other sources when not uh, being used for storage. Yep, okay, thank you, Clay. We also had a mention for um, while the loan is fixed, um, other costs may increase due to inflation. Yeah. Yeah, there's and it's it's hard to do some of these analyses because you're I mean, over 30 years, nothing is going to stay the same. <laughs> so it's it's a little crazy to try and try and think about that. And it depends on, you know, what are almond pollination fees going to be in 10 years? Uh, I'm not sure that anybody knows. So um, yeah, it's definitely a, a tricky question to answer. Thank you, Brittany. And I do think we might have Ellie back. Um, if anyone can recall the question for Ellie, I think it was around cost of that technology. But please correct me if I'm wrong or jump in. The cost of yeah, I, yes. So, um, typically for beekeepers, we found that it works best to do uh, a rental based on the number of months. Um, right now, we do a six month rental for I think it is four thousand, but we're coming out with a three month rental. Um, so we don't do it on a per hive basis. If we did it on a per hive basis and you're capturing the images, it's anywhere from $1.50 to $6 a hive. Thank you, Ellie. We've got a lot of good brainstorming going on here because we also have from Clay insurance premiums, increase in gym use of solar mm -hmm. panels to offset utility costs or possible federal subsidies. Yeah, all great, all great suggestions. And I do want to say, I think we might have a few federal loan um, representatives in the audience. Um, so we might ask them to comment on the status of, or any updates um, in the panel. So I'll try to see who's here. But any questions for Brittany? Otherwise, we will start to um, transition to our next speaker. Thanks for, for all of the feedback on this. I think this will be really helpful. Um, so, and thanks for having me here today. Thank you so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate your time. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Brittany. I will ask um, Jason, if you're ready, we're slightly ahead of schedule, but we can start with you or I can do a few more poll questions. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, great. Let's see, I'm looking for you. Here we go. Okay, go ahead. Oh, um, let me introduce you. <laughs> so joining us again today is Jason Miller. You might recognize him from our panel yesterday, Miller Honey Farms. He is going to talk with us about decision making tech and tech services use with buildings. So thank you, Jason, and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Um, let me get this full screen here. All right. We up and looking good? Yeah, looks great. Um, so we built our own building uh, five years ago, an, in, an indoor wintering building. We've been doing indoor wintering for, for a long time here at Miller Honey. Um, just to give you guys a little background, I'm a fifth generation beekeeper uh, and we used to indoor winter 
Well, even before indoor wintering, we brought all of our bees to California and, and set them out here in the fall uh, after we were in North Dakota for the summer. And then we would, you know, move them into the, the almonds or, or wherever from, uh, from our outdoor yards in California. And then we started overwintering in Idaho in potato cellars, so unrefrigerated potato cellars. And we did that about 20 years ago. We got started with that. And, um, and that worked well for, for a lot of years. But there were a number of drawbacks to um, to that model of you know trying to rent space uh, and a facility that wasn't ideal for the bees and the logistics around that. So about uh, five or six years ago, we started kind of brainstorming what would it look like if we could build a building um, that was ideal for the bees, not necessarily ideal for for us in every sense, but let's look at it from the bees perspective. What would indoor wintering done right be if you were, if you were a honeybee? So we thought kind of about their natural habitat and, and what if we really push to, to mimic that uh, habitat? And so we have a building that would be cold and maintain that, that cold temperature. It would be dark uh, to minimize activity and stimulation. It would be dry, sheltered from the elements, obviously, um, that the equipment and the bees wouldn't be dealing with uh, with those environmental conditions. It would be quiet, and that turned out to not be uh, at all what the what the standard was that we were getting from the various companies that were um, advising us and that had done a number of indoor buildings. Uh, there wasn't at all this notion of, of a quiet, calm building. Rather, it was more like hurricane force winds being driven in through the walls or through the floors, uh, lots of high-speed fans, lots of tumultuous air, um, sort of like Dorothy in, in Wizard of Oz. So that was the guidance we were getting. Uh, and, and we thought, well, you know, we'd really like a quiet building um, that minimized the vibration, the noise, the disruptions to the bees that they could really, um, uh, their metabolism could potentially drop even lower. And, and then finally was this model that we, we wanted to achieve of low touch beekeeping. And um, low touch beekeeping as, as we kind of defined it was, how could we reduce the number of times we move a beehive? So every time we move a beehive, we consider that a touch. And between in our old model, when we were overwintering in Idaho, uh, we were we had our bees in small yards in, in North Dakota and we would touch them once to group them up into bigger yards so we could more effectively feed them, uh, medicate them and deal with uh, getting them out of potentially uh, yards that weren't ideal when when rain or snow came. So we we'd do that touch and then we would touch them again where we would move them into a holding yard in North Dakota. Uh, staging them to get ready to go onto a semi. And then we'd touch them again, loading them onto a semi that would make the trip out to Idaho. And at that point, we're at three touches. Well, it wasn't cold enough in Idaho for us to put our bees inside at that point, because again, these were unrefrigerated potato cellars that we were renting. And so we'd have to unload them out in a field in Idaho, uh, in a big holding yard where they would uh, fly, consume feed, share disease for a number of weeks until about right after Thanksgiving, usually late November, we'd be able to, to then move them again into the potato cellar of Idaho. And then we would load them. Now we're at six touches, load them onto a semi destined for California. But because of how much had gone on between that, that yard in North Dakota and coming to California, we weren't as confident. We were getting a lot, quite high losses over winter. So we'd offload them into a holding yard in California at our warehouse here in Northern California, which is where I am right now, and go through them all and kind of sort things out and grade them and, and figure out what was good enough to, to go into pollination. And then we would load those hives onto a semi down into the uh, orchard and then place them in the orchard. So a minimum of nine touches, if, if everything went right, uh, we would move those bees about nine times between their summer yard in North Dakota and then their pollination in, in the almonds in California. So this low touch kind of sprang from each time we're moving those, we're damaging woodenware, uh, we're, we're causing stress on the hive, we're killing queens as those you know hives get moved around and shuffled and frames move and hey, stack falls off a truck occasionally, you know, we're 
uh, a lot of employees and a lot of things to go to go wrong between all of those different moves and touches. So we looked at it, if we were, say, inducing two or 3% loss each time we touch a hive, just at a 2% loss at nine touches, we're almost 20% loss, just even if we do everything else perfect uh, in the number of moves. So how could we reduce that model and get to this low touch beekeeping that, that we've strived for across the organization? And uh, out of this, this idea came a building in which we now move the bees from our uh, yard, our summer yard in North Dakota into our winter building. So they, they don't get grouped up. They don't go into holding yards. They go straight from their little yard of 40 hives in North Dakota into our winter building. And then from there, we load them onto a semi and bring them straight into the orchard in California. So they, they don't get inspected. They go right into the orchard, no inspection, no look until after they've been placed. So we've gone from nine to two. And right there, um, hard to quantify. I don't have a research paper to point to on that, although I do have a number of research papers that, that I'll talk about as far as building our building and, and uh, share with you guys at the end. But I believe that was one of the largest uh, factors in the lowering our, our hive mortality that we found with this building that often isn't talked about and, and kind of is, is not something at the forefront of one's mind when thinking about you know, the benefits of, of, uh, of a building and, and indoor wintering. So with that, uh, we built what, what my father has coined as the Winter Palace. And that is out in Southeast North Dakota. And um, it's the building there in the background. So in the foreground is our honey extraction facility and our comb storage buildings. And then in the back, that building with the four bump outs uh, is, our, is our wintering building. And those four bump outs, we'll look at in a minute, those are our air handling rooms. So that's where the air handlers are. At the top of the roof there in the center, you can see the exhaust vent where we exhaust uh, air out of the building. And um, it's a 18,000 square foot building. It's insulated, as you can see, blown insulation, about three inches of insulation throughout. And we built it for a hive capacity of about eight or about 16,000 hives. And I'll start off here with a lot of heavy numbers while everyone's paying attention. You're not asleep yet. And, and we'll go through how did we come up with this 16,000 hive capacity? Because uh, we heard Brian talk about horsepower. We hear about tons. We hear about watts. We hear about BTUs. And all of that is going to be affected somewhat based on where your climate is, how well your building is insulated, how big your colonies are. And so the research papers that, that, that we use to help calculate this have very wide uh, variations in what they recommend as far as cooling and capacity tolerances. And so we really looked at it from, all right, there's three methods that to look at when calculating the amount of hives we can put into a building. And the first method here is the amount of airflow. You've got to have airflow going to these hives and, and fresh air coming in, as well as just the movement of air in the building. And so what we have is four air handler units, each of which is 4,000 CFM, and that's 16,000 CFM. Research, and again, I'll reference all this research at the end, recommends about a half to one CFM per hive. So based on that, we could do uh, 17 to 30,000 hives in our building. The next method is our cooling capacity. And that's the really expensive uh, capacity to build in. And, and Asher's talked a lot about cooling and refrigeration and, and issues around that. So, um, and expense. So what, what we have currently is 1.2 million BTUs of cooling or uh, around 100 tons. And if we convert that into watts, that's what a lot of the research talks about is watts. And, and so it's 350,000 watts. You can see how wide the variation of recommended watts per hive is from eight to 34 is, is an enormous uh, spread. We use 20 watts, considering that we have quite big colonies coming in that are gonna produce a lot of heat. And, um, and we're overwintering doubles. And, uh, but we do have a very well insulated building and we're in a pretty cold climate. So, so all those things kind of balancing out. Uh, based on our cooling capacity, we have capacity for about 17,000 colonies. Another capacity number that was thrown around, uh, I've seen in a lot of different um, places is about 
150 hives per ton. So based off that calculation, we're at 15,000. And then finally is the building volume, just how much physical space do you have in that building? We way underutilize our physical space because we built the building to pull semis through. So it not like a potato cellar where we would start at the back wall and, and build rows. And we'll see that in some of the pictures. Rather, we can load buildings or load semis and unload semis right inside the building. So we're going to be low on our utilization of building volume. But there you can see the calculations on that. We have capacity for 20 to 25,000 hives. Now, uh, Brian talked quite a bit about temperatures and the fight for shutdown. And that is a very real thing is this fight to get the hive shut down because they're coming in. Hopefully, Mother Nature has helped in that shutdown if you're in a climate um, where it, it's cooling off in the fall. If you're up in the, the northern Idaho, North Dakota, Montana, Washington, hopefully some of that's happened naturally for you. But uh, regardless, there's going to be brood and she's not going to be completely ready to shut down. And so they're going to try to maintain temperature for a while until you just overcome the hive um, and really get it to go to go broodless, to get that honey cold, to get that queen shut down and get them to really cluster up. And and then your your demand goes way down. But in order to kind of expedite that happening, we load our building at 30 degrees and uh, one of the issues is when we open up doors for trucks to pull in, we're pulling in hot trucks with engines and forklifts and guys and big bees, lots of brood, warm honey. Um, and so what will happen is because of all that, the, high, the bees will start coming out. And as soon as they fly, they're dead. You know, once they leave that hive, they're dead. And so we don't want bees flying. They cause problems with the equipment. And, and it's an immediate loss. So we want to shock them with, with a pretty cold temperature when we're loading. Once we have that building fully loaded, uh, we bring it up to 40 degrees. And that's just the recommended temperature right in that range, 39, 41, uh, for an, a good balance of food consumption, low metabolic rate, and, and good overwintering conditions. I'll go through some of these slides fairly quickly. Those, this is a picture of one of those bump outs. We're looking at an air handler. So the air handlers are what draw fresh air in from, from outside and, and then can mix that at any percent. Rather, They can either recycle the air where they're just um, filtering the inside air and bringing in no fresh air or 100% fresh air and no recirculation. And what we call, we call that free cooling when we're just able to cool our building off of um, the fresh air outside. And that's when temperatures are below about 30 degrees um, outdoors, we get into this free cooling mode where we modulate the temperature based on how much fresh air we're drawing in. Up until that point, if it's warmer than 30 degrees outside, it's 100% refrigeration that, that's cooling. Um, I was also going to mention that um, what we did is ductwork. You can see the ductwork across the ceiling there. We tried to mimic more like what you have in, in a, you know, if you went to a concert or basketball game or you walked through Costco, you wouldn't have big air vents blowing up through the floor or through the walls that were hitting you with high pressure air. That was a, a lot of what the conventional um, designs were that we were seeing is laying out your hives on a very specific grid in a building to then blow air through those rows. And um, this layout is a lot more flexible. We can place the bees in any configuration we want within the building because it's just cold air being uh, dropped down from the ceiling through those, those vents. And in fact, it's so calm when we're just running free air and free cooling that we don't even, we have to hang stringers from those uh, vents to know that the that air is coming out because you can't feel it, you can't hear it. Um, and uh, so it's very calm when, when it's cold outside. And most of the time that our bees are, are in this building, it's cold. And so we're getting that free, free cooling. Now, during the times that it's warm and, and even at times at the beginning, even if we do have cold days fighting that shutdown, we're gonna be running a lot of refrigeration. And we wanted to put our bees in quite early. And so we have a lot of refrigeration capacity. And um, what we're seeing up there, on the, the tops of the building are the inside evaporators and then the outside uh, compressors that are that are running the refrigeration. One of the things we learned early on was that we needed to have uh, electric defrost. We spent a lot of money ripping out a lot of equipment that couldn't go down into these sub-freezing temperatures, couldn't be set to 30 degrees. And uh, even at 40 degrees, 
when you go in, eventually this equipment ices up because there's a huge water load, that uh, moisture load, moisture vapor that the bees are releasing, both from their respiration, from the consumption of honey, uh, from the hives, you know, high humidity just coming into the building from outside. It could have been raining, could have been, you know, snow ahead of times. Just there's moisture in those pallets that were on the ground. So you're pulling a lot of moisture out of the building. And moisture is, is a huge, um, it consumes a lot of refrigeration. And so if you have really dry air, you're going to need less refrigeration. But uh, we're in a fairly high humidity and uh, our bees you know, are, are respirating a lot with big colonies. And so you're dealing with a lot of humidity that will freeze up these coils on the refrigeration equipment. So early, our first iteration, we did not have electric defrost when we built this building. And so the coils would freeze up and the building's at, you know, say 38, 40 degrees. It would take a really long time for those coils to defrost and all that water to come out of the building and then for the compressors to be able to, to start up again. And so we had to take all those out. We're talking a lot of water. I mean, 50 gallon drums filling with water um, outside the building, but just we were doing some measurements and I took out a little five gallon bucket thinking we'd, we'd kind of take some, it overfilled that in just uh, seconds. So it's a, it's a lot of water that we're dumping out of this building. And that required us to switch over to electric defrost, where now when those uh, evaporators ice up, we go into an electric defrost very quickly, de-ice them, and all that water pours out in a matter of minutes, and we're back into refrigeration um, generally within 20, sometimes 30. There's sensors that sense once all the ice is melted and then we go back in. It could take as long as 45 minutes, but often it's, it's a lot less than that. Um, and we designed it to add capacity as needed um, if we want to increase. Because like I mentioned earlier, we're limited based on our refrigeration capacity, but that is an expensive piece to add. Quickly, uh, the lighting, you know, as we talked about, the, the bees really can't see red light very well. And so all of our lighting in the building is dual. We have white and red lighting. Uh, the employees use red headlamps when they're working inside the building. And we, we just wanted to find a light that the bees couldn't get into. And we found that in the, the big ass lighting that was designed for uh, dairy barns where you could pressure wash the light fixtures. Um, and, and so those have been completely sealed from, from bees getting in, which you know seems like a small thing, but it was a constant battle with, with bees getting into light fixtures and, and then you know, obfuscating the, the light output. A uh, small office space and, and bathroom for employees to use and defrost when when they're in there loading that building at 30 degrees, um, it's it's pretty cold and your hands and your feet when you're sitting on a forklift, they freeze in a hurry. And so a spot where they can take a break and, and come in and, and warm up. Uh, this is also where we house a lot of the monitoring and, and electronics and Wi-Fi and, and sensors and computer and, and all that equipment that I'll show you know, here in a minute. This is us actually loading the building and, and what it looks like inside with, with bees. As far as I know, one of the earliest in the U.S., if not the earliest, to load our building and put our bees away for the winter. Our goal is October 1st that we're, we're starting. It takes us about 10 days to, to load the building. You know, in reality, we're dealing with Mother Nature. Is, are there storms going on? Has she cooled off? You know, are these days in the 70s outside? That's we're not going to be moving a lot of bees in at that point. So we really need to wait till temperatures in the highs are down into the 60s, ideally in the 50s. And then we can really start loading fast. But generally, we load in about 10 days uh, with a goal of October 1st, but but we're not able quite to hit that most years. So we're 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 in for sure by the end of October, but oftentimes by mid-October, we're we're completely done loading. There you can see the stacks. We go eight high in the building. And then uh, we go seven or eight rows deep with about uh, 18 inches between, between rows, a couple of feet between rows. And then that whole center aisle is maintained open for semis to, to pull in when it's time for us to, to load out. So obviously we could fit a lot more in this building if we were to close it off in, in that sense. But we don't have the refrigeration to do that. And, and the ability to load semis in the dark, well, with the red lighting, uh, is just been really uh really a big win so we spent a lot of time on our on our environmental monitoring um and we designed this this interface in-house to 
to really optimize it for all the things. I'm a, I'm a data junkie. I come from a background. I was an engineer at Apple Computer. And so one, I see technology fail a lot. And um, we have, you know, literally all the eggs in one basket here in, in our company with this building. And so we wanted super redundant environmental monitoring and uh, backups for every system backups and for every monitor backups. And, and so what I saw out there was like really basic stuff. We weren't able to get all the information that we wanted. And so uh, we, we worked over a couple of years on designing this interface that shows us everything we want to see in a, in a snapshot of our building. You can see the overall cooling load on the equipment there. You can see we monitor CO2 both on the floor and on the ceiling. Um, we have warnings in the building, and I'll get into CO2 quite a bit a little bit later. We see load on each individual system, um, and then any errors are highlighted, alarms, we're getting text messages through. For our employees that are on site, for them not having to log into a system, we wanted something where if they don't speak English, they're not computer savvy, they can just walk into that office space and see what's going on. What are the temperatures? What's the CO2 level? And so we have a touch screen in there that the employees can view what's happening and also run a ventilation mode um, if that CO2 is, is unsafe. We have alarms for temperature, obviously CO2, humidity levels, any component failures, power outages, uh, getting beyond a, a system load, icing of the equipment. We're monitoring indoor and outdoor temperatures, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide because we have trucks and forklifts that, that come in there. Our forklifts run off propane, uh, but they still do produce a little bit of carbon monoxide. Um, and we have both visual and audible alarms for all those levels. And then we can historically see what's been happening in the building. So this is a little bit of the historical trending that, that we've got um, visibility into. If we look at that top graph, that's CO2 levels in the building. And so we, we hold it up there at, at 50,000. We don't go over that threshold. And I'll, I'll talk a little more to that. You can see in the background there that we're at 50,000 in uh, on the screen there. Danger, both to the humans, we're just over it there. And then and then we get alarms, danger for the bees if, if we breach that, that 50,000 threshold. Um, our space temperature, we can chart over time. You can actually see on that bottom graph, that's where we went from loading the building down at 30 degrees, roughly up to that 40 degrees once the building was, was loaded and we bumped those temperatures up. So that's some historical... Uh, graphing. As I mentioned, redundant monitoring, you know, um, talking with a lot of B guys, it was like, well, what happens if your internet goes down? Uh, I don't know. Well, what if your backup power fails to come online? Uh, yeah, that'd be a problem, you know? And so I, I just, I can't sleep at night unless we really have super robust monitoring because A, we're not out there. I'm not physically out there. We do have an employee on site. Um, checking on it, but you know, he's not there living inside this building 24 seven and he wouldn't be alive if he was in that building uh, regularly because of those CO2 levels. So we needed super robust uh, monitoring of, of all the systems and that meant redundant monitoring. So not only do we have the primary monitoring that we looked at earlier, but we have this redundant monitoring that is not using our internet connection. It's cellular based. And so I'd say, well, if you're relying on cellular, then what happens if that goes out? Then you, you would want an internet, you know, based to, to be your backup. We're internet based, hardwired fiber optic to the building. But if that goes out, we have a backup cellular. Um, this backup monitor has batteries, inside of it so it's it's able to report out that there's been a power failure if our backup generator doesn't come on it's monitoring temperature it's monitoring humidity and it's monitoring for water water on the floor um remote temperatures in different spots of the building and humidity the nice thing about this is it's really cheap and so for those that are looking it's designed for homes and rvs and um a lot of different applications but one, they gave me a discount when I told them I was going to mention it. They said, hey, people can can use this code MillerBees25. I promise I'm not selling you something, but if you want a deal on it, we've been using it for a number of years and it's worked quite well and you can get it at thehivemonitor.com. So um, that's our backup monitoring solution. And here's what, what the interface looks like on that. So the, the various parameters that we're monitoring, the temperature there in, in red, the humidity in blue, and, and then the power is that green bar showing consistent power. And it's really easy just to set your levels of, 
um, you know, tolerances. You can see the safe ranges there on the left and right that, that we set. What are our tolerances for temperature and, and humidity on our, this again is just our backup monitoring uh, system there. So uh, employee safety. You know, the, the carbon monoxide and the dioxide I talked about, the, one of the monitors that is shown there in the bottom, that screen is uh, visual. It's our backup CO2 monitoring. So uh, we looked at our primary monitoring on the web interface, but again, employees are not going to be logging in. What if someone wanders into the building uh, looking for someone? You know, what if um, some an employee forgot something out there? They're just going to go in real quick. So we wanted something where they could visually see what the levels were in the building, but uh, someone walking off the street isn't even going to know how to interpret that. So this system also has both visual alarms with flashing lights and audible alarms. So when we get above 10,000, uh, we, we have flashing lights. And then when we get above uh, 30,000, we have audible alarms. And then we have signs up on all the entrances saying, if you go in this building and there are alarms going, you know, you need to immediately exit the building. And it's pretty obnoxious in there because we don't want people um going to sleep there for the winter and and not waking up so um pretty big deal on the on the co2 we have fire suppression i'm afraid that by the time a fire got going it would kind of be a, a moot point but uh we do have on-site fire there with, with a big fire hose we have a fall restraint for employees loading semis that's that uh yellow thing you can see up there at the top with a, a big cable so we have a harness they can buckle into employees don't want to use it so um, I've used it before. You know, it's one of those things you don't think anything's going to happen till it till it does. And so uh, it's a concrete floor, and you're 14 feet up. And uh, so we have a fall restraint for employees that are loading semis in there. We have a rolling ladder just just to make it a little bit safer getting up and down off of trucks. Some of the extras that we've integrated into our building is uh, smart garage door openers, meaning that they're internet connected. Employees can open them with an app, uh, with their Apple Watch. I've been shocked by how much we've used this. I thought we would use it a little bit, you know, while we're loading, but because you use the building, you find a lot of other uses for it that, that we'll talk about. Having smart garage door openers that employees can open and close and you can open and close without getting out or having remotes in every forklift truck. Boy, that's been a, been a big win that, that we just didn't, I didn't foresee it being such a big thing. We have web connected um, smart smoke detectors. We have a backup generator on site. They're showing at the bottom right. It can only run 50% of our cooling capacity in the building, uh, but it can run 100% of our airflow and all the other building functions. So we figured, you know, as long as we can keep it dark and keep air flowing, keep fresh air coming in, the bees aren't going to die in a short in a short time. Um, e even if it was a really warm day, we can still run half of our cooling capacity. But generally, when we have power outages out there, it's this time of year. It's ice storms. And uh, North Dakota right now, I just looked at the map earlier, is like every road in North Dakota is shut down um, uh, because of the current storm conditions that are going on out there. And and that's been a big concern of ours when we were building this building out there. It was like, man, what about, you know, shipping bees and, and trucking bees that far in that cold of temperatures? Uh, and, and what might be the issues that, that will arise from that? What we just to touch on that briefly, uh, what we found is that the bees have done done great, uh, assuming that, you know, we have been shut down a little bit for weather conditions or delayed. I shouldn't say shut down, but delayed leaving a day or two. But generally where we have the problems is over the I-80 pass. It's coming into California. So whether we had built this building in, in Reno, you know, just across the, the border where it's cold, uh, or we built it, you know, all the way out in North Dakota, we don't really run into the problems in that, in that area. It's right here at the California border where we generally have problems. So unless we built it here in California, uh, we're, we're going to potentially be dealing with winter shutdowns. Um, our, we have video surveillance with infrared night vision so we can see everything in the building at night um, or even not at night, but when the when the lights are out and the bees are in there and then indoor and outdoor uh, Wi-Fi in that building. I wanted to just get a little bit more into CO2. This is all from from Brandon mostly and, and talks with the research he's been doing up there in in Washington. Um, I was pretty intrigued by what what he was seeing and doing and and so I called him up and said, Brandon, you know, what could we do to maybe harness some of the, the Varroa benefits, but not run a research trial on our, on our whole company? And uh, 
and, and give me a number that won't kill the bees. Because if you kill the bees, I'm going to come kill you. So uh, Brandon was was really gracious to to work with us on on coming up with something that he felt really confident that we wouldn't be running a research trial on our whole company, but yet we might see some uh, some benefits to Varroa control with this high CO2. And his advice was don't let it go over 50,000, hold to 50,000 um, and, and hold it as long as you know, you're, we're able to or comfortable with uh, paying the bills to, to hold it at that level. And just to put 50,000 in context, outside air is about 400 parts per million. We hold the building at 8,000 when employees are in their loading. So we have what's an employee mode or a ventilation mode where um, our system will bring in outside air. Even if the temperature is really warm, it's going to bring in outside air and, to hold the building at 8,000. It's 10,000 is the Minnesota. North Dakota doesn't have any guidance. Typical North Dakota, they're kind of a hands-off state. Um, love that. But uh, in some ways, they, they don't have as much guidance as, as other states. I'm sure California probably has an even lower ones than this, so I'm going to use Minnesota's. Uh, there's, there's this 10,000 for an eight-hour exposure limit for employees, and then a 15-minute exposure limit of 30,000. Putting these in percents, 10,000 is 1% CO2. 30,000 is 3%. So what we're doing is we're holding our building at 5% CO2, and we're generally trying to hold that for a minimum of 10 days during our overwintering period. Uh, our bees, as I mentioned, are in there for a long time. They go in the first week of October, and those first ones in, unfortunately, are the last ones out. So they're not coming out until the first week in February. It's a solid four-month block that they're in there, but they're only being exposed to this high CO2 typically for about 10 days, two weeks. Because it's so expensive for us to hold at this level, we can't bring in any fresh air. Uh, otherwise, that that is just going to drop um, as you as you can kind of see there on the early side of that chart. But as soon as we shut off all fresh air, that level starts rising and and will generally pretty quickly hit 50,000 um, in, in about two or three days. And then we can hold it there. But again, we're having to run pure refrigeration to cool the building during during that time. So what have we seen from this CO2? What I'll call high CO2. This is not research. This is not published papers. This is beekeeper trials, beekeeper research. So um, don't don't take anything for gospel here. In January of 2017, when we, when we first built our building, we had a low. We didn't know anything about this CO2 thing. We came out of our building. These are numbers coming out of our building of 2.13 mites. Really, what that is, is piss poor mite control. That is beekeepers being beekeepers and not doing a good job of their mite controls in the fall. And so we came out with higher mites than, than, uh, than ever before, uh, than we would have typically seen uh, even before we built our building. And, uh, but then the next year, we kind of got that under control and, and we were at 0.13 mites coming out. Again, low CO2. In 2019, in typical beekeeper fashion, we failed to take uh, or, or log or you know, I don't know what happened. We messed up and we didn't get that data uh, coming out of the building. We, we take these levels in the orchards with BIP um, so that we have really consistent, you know, it's, it's not us, it's BIP coming out and taking those mite levels and then giving us those reports. Now, in January of 2020, we had the same amount of mites, low CO2 again. But look what happened here in 2021, 2022, when we went to the high CO2. Our mites went down uh, you know, quite a large statistically significant factor. I think uh, I can say that's about as scientific as I can get with, with what we've seen on Varroa levels. But I'll be interested to see what happens this winter. We've had a harder time holding the really high CO2 this year. The bees are a little bit smaller uh, colonies, and it's been really windy in North Dakota. The wind right now, I just looked at it this morning, is like 40 degrees, uh, or sorry, 40 mile an hour winds all day. And when the winds are that high, the building is sealed really tight, but it's still, it's a very small amount of air. If I ventilate this building at 2% fresh air, that level will drop way down. So we really need it to be 100% sealed for the to achieve these kind of uh, CO2 levels. And we just don't have it when the wind is whipping 40 miles an hour outside. Um, a lot of questions about weight. You know, what is weight loss in the building? What, what, what do we see for... For weight. And uh, here's our 2020-2021 weights. Uh, we went in there, you can see average hive weight of 126 pounds. We came out at 109 
pounds, and we lost less than 1% of our hives to starvation. The loss per day, if you want to look at it per day, it, it was 0.14 pounds, 2.3 ounces. Loss per week is about a pound a week. So slice that whatever way you want. That's what we lost that year. Now, the next year, we have another example of piss poor beekeeping. We put our hives in at 112 pounds. Uh, we had some issues getting feed that year, and we thought we had semis ordered that didn't show up and, and a number of things that happen in the real world. I know you scientists never make these kind of mistakes, but us beekeepers occasionally drop the ball. And uh, we went in way too light, and we knew we were way too light. And we came out at only 90 pounds. We lost, fortunately, I was shocked that we only lost about 5% of the hives to starvation because our average weight coming out was 90 pounds. The bees, of course, decided to consume the most that we've ever logged uh, that year. So they were consuming uh, one point three, 1.4 pounds per week that year. So not only did they go in way too light, they were big colonies and they were hungry. This year, in typical beekeeper fashion, we snapped to the other end of the spectrum. We put them in at 141 pounds, too heavy. So we're going to be shipping, you know, 300 hives to a semi and at $6 a mile or $5.50 a mile, it's going to hurt. And, uh, you know, that's just uh, the, how we do things around here. So, uh, just right, and then too light, now too heavy. And I was just actually looked this morning at the hive scale in the building, and uh, we're going 0.12 pounds per day, right, as of now, 0.84 pounds per week. So they're not consuming much. They went in extra fat. So, of course, they're not cooperating, and they're hardly eating anything. And uh, like I mentioned, slightly smaller colonies than, than what we had that prior year. Uh, we're currently sitting at 132 pounds per hive. So we got some some fat girls in there. We've only lost nine pounds and we'll be coming out in, in uh, another two or three weeks. Electric costs. How much does it cost to run this building? Fortunately, we are in North Dakota with the cheapest utilities of the entire US. I don't think anywhere else is paying nine cents a kilowatt hour. At my house here in California, peak pricing is 55 cents per kilowatt. A cheap pricing in the middle of the night is like 30 cents a kilowatt. So just to contrast that, if we were paying California prices in electricity, um, you know, they're in North Dakota under a full load. Our building is about $15,000 a month, but we never have to run a full month of refrigeration. You can see that that, that, that November bill, uh, which this is all prior. So it's the October to November window that, that's really expensive. And that's about that seven dollars $8,000 um, utility bill. And then it goes down from there as the temperatures cool off and uh, you can see the, the cost there. But you can you can extrapolate those out based on whatever your utilities are. I just know in California, this would be about a $50,000 a month uh, refrigeration bill. And we'd be refrigerating a lot more because of outside ambient temperatures. Right now it's uh, 48 degrees where, where I am. And it's a really cold day. So here in California, this would be a very expensive proposition. Uh, our building costs, we built this obviously pre-COVID, pre-inflation, and uh, it cost us about $2 million between the building, refrigeration, all that infrastructure that, that went in to make that happen. We had to bring out three-phase power, and that, that cost a little bit. When Brian was talking about power, that is a big consideration. You know, if you're thinking about, that's something we didn't even consider. Yeah, we had power there. But do you have three phase power and and they had the utility trenched it for like a quarter mile to bring three phase power out to us and um, that that it can be a big, a big factor in whether or not you can run enough refrigeration because it's a lot more efficient if you can if you have three phase power so our building is running at 208 volt three phase power on on that refrigeration. But you know what we've seen is our winter losses have been cut drastically through this this building. Um, we used to average between 30 and 40 percent winter losses. That's why we'd have to go through them here in California. There was no way we were putting them out in the orchard to then turn around and pick up 50 percent of our hives. So um, we have cut that last year. We rented, so got paid on, rented 91 percent of the colonies that went into that building, uh, which was our, our best year ever. And that was despite losing starving 5% of the colonies. We shoot for a 90% rental. A 90% of what goes into that building uh, getting paid for when we go into the uh, to almonds in January. Now, that doesn't mean, though, 
that we haven't lost bees. What happens is we're taking our losses earlier in the season. We are losing a lot less in the, you know, even if we take the combined, because we're picking up another 10% usually in the fall. So really that 10% loss is, is more like a 20% loss. If we look at everything we picked up in the fall, plus everything we picked up in January. And, and you kind of have to look at that through the wintering. You can't put those sick, small, uh, four frame hives into your building and hope to come out with uh, rentable colonies. I tell the guys we're going to lose about two frames of bees, two to three frames per hive. So when you're looking at that five frame hive in October and you want to kiss it and you want to feed it and you want to put it away and hope you're going to get out a rentable unit in January, it's not going to happen. So rather than paying the utilities to store it, paying to ship it to California, paying to place it into the almonds, and then paying the labor to pick it up and bring it back to your warehouse, just take the loss in that September, October timeframe and only winter strong colonies. I can't stress that enough. You, it's not a hospital for sick, for sick bees. And uh, you won't, you will lose, we lose about two frames per hive. So if they're those big 12 frame hives, they're gonna look great. And they're gonna come out uh, as a 10 frame, you know, colony. But if you're trying to put in five, six framers uh, in the fall, you won't be happy with, with what you get. Um, so we've been able to rent, you know, roughly 3,000 additional hives into the almonds year over year. Um, and that equates to a very fast building payoff. And that doesn't even factor in, you know, less requeening that we're seeing um, because of, of queen stress. These queens are shutting down completely for four months of the year and not laying reduced varroa loads, as you saw when we would bring them here to California or, or there in, in Idaho where they were flying around for quite some time in large holding yards, you know, we're swapping a lot of disease and a lot of varroa. We're not feeding them at all um, over that winter period. The wood is indoors and, and out of the elements, the pallets, all those things, they're not freezing to the ground and, and they're not sitting in soupy wet conditions. So your wood completely dries out, which really extends the life. You know, if, if wood gets a chance to dry out, a lot of those bacteria and microbes that are eating away at your woodenware, uh, they can't survive. And so they, they die off and you kind of get that nice reset. Not only are you getting a reset on the bees, you're getting a reset on your woodenware. And it's pretty significant how much longer our wooden wood is lasting um, now that we're, where we have this really long extended over winter period. So, uh, just another one of those seldom mentioned factors that, 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 that you say, or savings, I should say. Um, and then, you know, the labor, one of the reasons we want to get our bees in early is because most of our labor is H2A help from Mexico and they want to go home to their families. And so every week that I can put the bees away is more time they can spend with their families. And it's saving me $50,000 of payroll uh, to get to get people off of that really intense fall uh, labor time. And so it, it's a huge savings in, in labor hours. And then just stress level for myself and management, you know, once those bees are in there, my stress goes way down and, uh, and we're able to focus on other things and deal with, instead of firefighting the day-to-day -day issues of, of the operation, we're uh, being more strategic in our planning and, and, and what we're doing. Just uh, closing here with a couple of uh, slides, you know, things that we hadn't fully anticipated. Mice control is, is a huge thing in the building. We catch a lot of mice. We have found that my, my dad's favorite food is the best bait for mice. The only thing that loves spam more than my father are mice. And uh, that's his cabinet in his house uh, that I snapped that picture. So we use spam in our mouse traps and we catch a ton of mice, like upwards of 40 a night. Uh, at the front end. So all, you know, mice love a beehive in the fall. So they all come into the hives. And we used to be taking a ton of mice out in the spring and dealing with combs that are all chewed through and, you know, mice defecating everywhere in the, in the hive. And now we catch almost all of them in the building, either through, I think that high CO2, because we'll still find dead mice in the hive, but we never find alive mice ever. So I believe that at some point they succumb to the CO2 if they don't exit the hive and get caught by, by my dad's spam traps. Um, one of the misses I wish we would have done in our building is in-floor scales to, to weigh out our semis. You know, back when we built this, I think freight was like $3 a mile. It just was not a, a huge factor. Uh, now with freight up at five, $6 a mile, 
we I wish we could load every semi right to its maximum 80,000 weight and, and get that weight distribution just right. If we had in-floor scales, we could do that. We didn't do that. Wish we had. Maybe we'll look into some of those portable um, floor scales uh, at a future point. We've looked at dehumidification. So running large commercial dehumidifiers to help with that moisture load that I talked about um, requires a special type of desiccant dehumidifier to, to deal with these types of temperatures and, and they're expensive and they introduce a lot of heat load into the building. So um, we haven't gone that route yet, but been looking at it just because of how much we battle moisture here. Uh, my dad was a really important piece to the pre-inspection program. Uh, he kind of spearheaded that and got California Department of Ag to recognize pre-inspections. I believe this is only in Idaho and North Dakota. I can't remember if Montana is part of that. Uh, you can correct me there, but th this was a program piloted where the North Dakota Ag inspectors come out and inspect our hives and our pallets and make sure that we don't have any weed debris, dirt, bugs, and then they pre-certify our loads. So when we come across the border into California, our trucks go right through. It's just showing a paper that we have a pre-inspection and the truck rolls right through that trucky uh, inspection station instead of sometimes 20, 30 minutes. And now I, I think that the wait times have kind of been reduced because there's so many people participating in this that it's really reduced the number of B loads needing to be inspected at the at the border. But it's it's been a, a big win. And um, we spend a lot of time cleaning pallets in the fall. There's a video that I don't, I wish I had a link to it, that the Department, North Dakota Department of Ag has put out showing us uh, cleaning our hives or our pallets and what we do to, to get them ready to go in. So we scrape off all, like I said, weed debris and dirt and, and get them really clean so we can always pass that, that inspection um, inside the building. You know, other people are using their buildings in what I think are really innovative ways and uh, doing a lot of cool things. We haven't done as much. I we really we did a trial in the spring of putting a semi truck in there uh, and trying to hold it to see how long we could we could hold the bees, and we just didn't have enough weight in them, and they were getting close to starvation after just a week. So uh, we need to get better at managing that because I think there's a lot of opportunity there. We do currently use our building for in, in the spring. If weather is bad in North Dakota, we'll pull semis into that building, let them sit for a day or two till the weather is better. We can offload the semi onto small trucks all inside the building. And then once the weather looks good, those small trucks can roll out and, and place the hives into yards. Uh, that entire wall in the lower picture is all dead comb. And so uh, we'll use it to store store dead outs, keeps the wax moth out, you know, keeps, we don't have to deal with, uh, with any sort of pests in, in the wax when, when it's stored inside that building. Um, every year we host a landowner dinner. That's a picture of our landowner appreciation dinner. So all of our 300 plus landowners in North Dakota uh, come out, we cook them a big meal. We do some raffles, prizes, and, and host everybody for a night in our building. So uh, kind of one of those wouldn't have foreseen it, but uh, other uses that that we've kind of rolled into with this building. So um, I mentioned some of the resources that that we used. There's that really good guide that's done by Pam, uh, the guide to indoor storage. It was just updated. Version two is out, uh, updated there in 21. And that didn't exist. We built our building. So we relied very heavily on Rob Curry and Marla Spivak's uh, research. There's a chapter, I think it's chapter nine, uh, of winter management of honeybee colonies. And it's an old paper, but it served us really well in designing our building and coming up with those metrics. So um, with that, I'll wrap things up and, and take any questions. Great, Jason, thank you so much. Um, and I did see a few questions popping up in the chat, but I think we'll have to save those for the panel so that we can go to our break. That was just a ton of excellent information. And for anyone furiously taking notes, rest assured this um, conference has been recorded and we will share that with you all. Um, and we'll also get some links to those resources Jason mentioned and put them in the chat. So Jason, thanks again. And he'll, he will be joining us after the break. Um, so we will go to break now and come back at 1045 Pacific um, for some prizes and our panel session.
We're going to be getting started with our panel shortly. In the meantime, I'm going to put a few links in the chat with some of the resources um, that Jason mentioned, and we'll work on getting additional resources pulled together and, and sent out after the conference with the recording. All right, and that includes how to find that indoor storage guide that Jason mentioned. So while we're um, all getting into our seats again and getting ready for the panel, I wanna announce today's winners of our prizes. And just to remind you, our prizes are um, an online subscription to the American Bee Journal or an online subscription to Bee Culture. The Almond Board of California has also donated assorted Blue Diamond Almonds or a $20 Amazon gift card. We have Straight from the Farm Almonds from Nick Nut Farms or a George Hansen Original and Caustic Greeting Card. So I'm gonna call out some names and you don't have to do anything right now, but I'll be reaching out to you after the conference for you to select your prize and find out how to get it to you. So our winners today are Terry Thackrell, Brian Hayde, Elwin Stillman, Glennis Robinson, Linda Gorman, and Michael Huberland. So I'll just read those one more time. Terry Thackrell, Brian Hayde, Elwin Stillman, Glennis Robinson, Linda Gorman, and Michael Huberland. And before our panel, we have just two more poll questions. So if you could take a minute, if you use indoor storage or don't, um answer zero percent if you don't but how many colonies do you currently have in indoor storage and again these questions um help us understand the use of this practice and in future research directions as well so we really really appreciate you answering Looks like we have about half of attendees answered, so I'll give that another minute. Still have a few answers coming in. How many colonies do you currently have in indoor storage or what percentage of your colonies? Okay. I'm gonna end that and share the results. Hopefully you guys can see that. Maybe a fellow panelist give a shout if nothing's showing up. We can see it. Okay, great. Thanks, Danielle. All right. And then I have one more poll question. Which of the following is your primary motivation for using or potentially using indoor storage of honeybee colonies? Um, there's several options here. Okay. 
I'll just give another minute or so. Which of the following is your primary motivation for using or potentially using indoor storage? Okay, great. Let me share these results. So you can see what your peers are thinking. All right. So now we are gonna transition to the panel portion of this conference. Um, I had seen some questions coming into the chat for Jason, and we'll, we will also be pulling from pre-submitted questions from your registration forms. You're welcome to pop questions into the Q&A or raise your hand and we'll try to call on you and allow you to unmute yourself. So what I'm gonna ask for right now is for our panelists to turn their cameras on. And joining us for the panel today, um, we'll have Ellie Symes joining us again from this morning, Kimberly Drennan from Hive Tech Solutions, Dr. Brandon Hopkins, Washington State University. Hi, Brandon. We will have Jason Miller with us again. We have Ben Gilmore joining us, Ben Gilmore, Capoco Honey. Hi, Ben. And I also want to invite Brian Ashurst to join us today on the panel, if you're able to, Brian. Um, he wasn't able to join us yesterday, but Brian of Ashurst Honey Company, Ashurst Bee Company, excuse me, he was very generous in allowing our crew and researchers and access to his facilities for those two videos that we saw earlier in the conference. So hi, Brian. Let's see. Hey, Grace, I'm trying to turn my video on and it it's not letting me. It says the host stopped you. Oh. So is that Ellie? OK, yeah, Let me... I could leave and come back or no, same Perfect. here for Jason. OK, <laughs> let me help you guys out. All right. Perfect. That Sorry works. about that. OK, there you go. All right, so I think we are all here. And I also want to invite Danielle or my other co-hosts to jump in. Um, this is meant to just be an interesting and dynamic discussion, and we can ask each other questions and also help me please keep an eye on the chat in the Q&A. So I think where I want to start is... Um, with you, Kim, because you're a new face we haven't seen before in this conference, if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, and then we'll go to Ben and Brian. All right, thanks. Thanks so much, Grace. Um, and thanks, uh, Danielle, Project APSM, and all the fantastic contributors here. I'm, I'm really honored to be a part of it. So thanks for the invitation to be on the panel. Um, we've been working for the last several years on doing small scale overwintering. So when we talk about container storage or portable containers and kind of we do the small things. So it's between like 48 colonies, 100 colonies, things that are not a building, but are, are portable. Um, so I've been I've had the fortune of working with Ellie, with Dr. Gloria, uh, with Brandon and Ben. I think Ben's going to be kind of um, like the poster child of small scale success. He's just a, a fantastic beekeeper and we've had the pleasure of working with him over the last two years. So that's who I am. Great. And Ben, if you would like to say hi and maybe mention how you utilize indoor storage. Yes. Um, yeah, this is uh, Ben with Focus on EMP products. Yeah, I have had the, the pleasure of using um, Kim's modular indoor storage unit uh, last year and uh, again this year. Uh, we only put about 13 colonies or so in it. Um, I think the maximum holds about 32. 
um, but the success was was great. Um, and uh, and this year I've, I rented it out to another beekeeper as well um, at my store in Fort Collins. And uh, and I hope to be able to uh, rent it out even more to other other folks as well. So. Great, thank you. And Brian, if you just wanna say hi to everybody and, and maybe talk about the um, transition to using indoor storage for your bee operation. Okay, yeah, no, my name is Brian Ashers, uh, Southern California. Uh, yeah, we do not do an overwintering storage as you probably saw in the video. It's more of a brood break uh, thing and a work thing because in California and with our heat, there's a lot of uh, work rules. And so we kind of try to simplify some of that by bringing the bees to the workers as opposed to uh, having the, some of that work be done in the field where we have better control. And, um, uh, and, and it's good for the health too. So our primary, we haven't done a winter storage thing yet. We've discussed it, but we've never really uh, have done that. So it's mo mostly being utilized in a different capacity than what most people are doing, but we are seeing some good results doing it that way. And Jason, I wanted to tell you, I've seen your talk twice and it gets better every time. That was awesome. Great. Um, and I think to kick us off, I'm grabbing a question that was submitted and a topic that we haven't spent as much time on. So I wanted to make sure to get it, get it in there. And maybe I'll direct this to Kim is, what can you tell us about small scale storage options? Sure, well, um, what we focus on, they really are the places that you don't have as buildings where you're not having hallways or, or humans aren't really going in there. They are really container-based storage. And I just loved uh, Jason's talk because all the same problems that he had at the big scale, we deal with at the small scale. Um, so that was fantastic. You had just so much wonderful information and data um, looking at how you scale down all those systems to really work um, you know, to have portable storage, things that aren't like on your location full time, or if you choose to have it on there full time, you can. I think the same challenges exist for those kinds of um, models of operating as they do on the large scale. And I'm really excited to, to listen to sideliners and smaller beekeepers who don't who either don't have facilities nearby or, you know, maybe they're wanting to keep their bees local. A lot of organic farms, their bees can't travel. And so we want to provide some cold storage options that would work to, with somebody who has between 50 and like 500, maybe even a thousand. Um, but yeah, it's it's same problems, just a different size. And the beekeepers that I've worked with are extremely creative. Like I've learned more from the ways that they've been using it than I would have ever thought about. Great, thank you. And pulling an earlier question from the chat, in a commercial storage building, there might be 50,000 hives inside a single building. In columns, 400 hives per row, eight pellets high, 22 inches apart. Can you, and this is to anyone, can you envision the use of drones equipped with cameras flying successfully inside storage buildings or between rows and columns? I can speak to this a little bit, uh, to Ellie from the B Corp. Uh, we've looked at drones quite a bit on both indoor and outdoor use. Um, for outdoor use, it's a lot easier to walk the field and take images of hives. But for indoor use, I think it could be really useful, especially because, like is stated in this question, sometimes we're dealing with really small spaces um, that aren't meant to be walked between. So drones are something we're looking at. Um, we've also looked at fixed cameras as well. Could be another solution. Um, to be able to monitor the colonies while they're in there. Um, both, I think, would allow us to get in between those rows and get the images captured uh, for sure. And I think that would be the right use case. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Ellie and I have been talking about having a track along the rows where you could rotate a camera and take intermittent pictures so that you would know over time, every couple of weeks, what are the size of your colonies. So I, I think there's a lot of potential for mobile technologies to really help the indoor storage market. Very interesting, thank you. Grace, I'm gonna jump in and, and yep. put Ben on the spot. Ben, can you tell us how you use the mobile unit? I, I don't think we've heard much detail about that yet. Yeah, sure. Um, 
uh, last year we, um, I have my, my, my hives on four-way pallets. Um, I generally store my hives on top of other pallets on the ground. So that way I keep my bee pallets off the ground so they stay cleaner, which is nice. Um, just something that one of my beekeepers is like, why don't we just stack these on pallets? So I wouldn't have thought of that before. So just wanted to share that to keep your pallets clean. Um, but we just stack them in the, um, in the unit. There's a, uh, Kim built the first unit here, the prototype with uh, tracks on, or it was wheels on the bottom of sleds uh, to put the pallets on to slide them into the storage unit from uh, double doors in the front. Um, and we've, uh, I think she's decided to go away from that and go to a diamond, you know, just uh, uh, the, the diamond um, plating, you know, to, uh, so you can just slide the pallets in uh, with your lift instead. Uh, be a little, a little easier that way. Um, but yeah, just I just put my bees in there on pallets and stack them in there. And um, I, uh, I always feed, uh, put some feed on there with them too to make sure that they're eating a, um, a syrup with less digest, you know, indigestible solids and low moisture, you know, so they can, um, they can use up that excess of moisture to to uh, in their to eat with and. Um, and so they are less likely to develop dysentery in there when they're eating on the syrup instead of the honey. Um, and it was uh, had a hundred percent sex success rate that first year. Um, I put a range of colony strengths in there all the way from, I think it was just a, like a frame and a half or two frame colony all the way up to about you know, a 16 framer in there. And uh, um, they all basically came out the same strength. Um, of course, everybody, um kind of grades their their frames you know their colonies a little differently of course i'd say you know frame b's is three quarters covered um uh, what is it 70 degrees or so but you know it's, it's hard to um uh, grade that unless you've done it a lot uh so uh, a couple of them seem to have even increased in strength when we brought them out but that's just i think you know within the margin of error there so uh, and I just had a couple of colonies, those weaker ones. I think it was Jason that said that you can't expect to put in sick colonies to get out healthy colonies. Um, so they, uh, they were, they, the queens were there, but the, the stress or whatever the cause might be, um, they decided to requeen themselves uh, shortly after I, I removed them. Um, but other than that, uh, the colonies continued to do too great through the year. And, uh, I put a few more back into there this fall um, and I, I put them in um, versus another beekeeper here in Colorado. She put her bees in in uh, I think mid-October and kept them in there till March. And I think that was just a little extra too long. Um, <clears throat> I wait until, you know, the bees are more broodless until about mid-November. So the, I think it was the 18th of November, I put them in there um, and then they stayed in there. Um, and Kim has more of the details, of course, she's, uh, you know, keep track of all that data pretty close. Um, pulled them out about mid-March. Um, and so they they were all completely overwintered there. Um, I imagine it'd be a little bit more successful if I brought them out in January for almonds or something, but this is just a, it was a test uh, for overwintering, just some local colonies in Colorado. Um, and then of course I spent, sent the rest of my bees out to the almonds. So, um, but the, uh, the test was definitely very promising. This year, I rented it out to another beekeeper that had zero success last year uh, when he a newbie, and uh, I put all eight of his hives in there and um, went through them, graded them, and gave them some solid. Uh, what is it? Just some uh, uh, sugar patties, and we'll see. We'll see how those come out. So, Kim, I'm sure you want to add a, a little bit to that, but I'm wondering how does the economics work with such smaller scale? Um, what are the challenges and how's that looking? Yeah, the, um, it's it's really taken some, um, some creative ways of doing a business model where it would work. I think the most promising thing that we're looking at right now is similar to a storage pods system where you lease them out over a certain amount of time. So we've got a lease to own model, which um, we're hoping will be much more affordable on a year to year basis. And also, you know, folks can try it out. So if we're if we're leasing them and right now we're looking at about a six hundred dollar a month uh, cost. And uh, last year, the models took about fifty dollars a month extra in Colorado for their energy consumption. So plugging them in if you've got the right power source. Um, 
yeah, I think what we're what we're focusing on right now is a lease model that allows folks to try it out and if they like it, continue on or to kind of give it back and who knows what. But it seems like that's the best way for small beekeepers to look at it right now. If you want to make a full purchase, um, that one's kind of fun because you can depreciate the full asset you're, you're on the initial year. So I think looking at your overall operation and what you want to do with it, we've got um, a trial coming up where we're hoping to overwinter nukes, where that kind of coming out in January, February, you can start earlier, or you can sell those nukes um, if you are kind of wanting to sell your bees. So there's some creative financials behind it, but we're getting close to making it something that is affordable for smaller operators. How many five frame nukes does it hold? 60. The new one will hold about 65 frame nukes. Great, thank you. Sure. One of the um, topics we got a few questions about that I'll just ask if anyone has experience or resources with, um, are there resources for how to retrofit retrofit an existing space, a garage shed, barn, et cetera, for winter storage of dozens or hundreds of colonies? I mean, um, I, I think that, Really, one would be getting insulation uh, into the space and getting it um, not just airtight, but but B and light tight. So you really want it to be dark. We you know when when the lights are off in our building, it is completely pitch like cave black where you can't see your hand inches from your face. It's that dark. And so any sort of light, we even had a small monitor that just had a little light on its display. And we noticed after uh, a few weeks, you know, the floor of the building, you'll be shocked the first time if you put bees into a building, how many dead bees there are on the floor. Like there's a lot. Um, and, and you think that something's not going right, but that's just all those sick um, or summer bees that are dying off. There's just a large die off, especially early on. And um, I apologize for the noise, the printer's running. So that's me. But uh, one thing I'll say is where that little tiny display was, and we're talking a half inch by, by two inches, there was a huge pile of dead bees under that, a uh, much larger amount of dead bees underneath the tiny little display in, in the building. So, uh, you know, getting it completely dark is going to be, you know, step one, getting it insulated and then getting a refrigeration. And I, I would say not an HVAC. So there's like air conditioning people and that's a world and they're great for your house and they're great for getting, making you comfortable. There's a refrigeration world. We made the mistake the first time, and I see Kim nodding her head, of thinking this was air conditioning. And so we talked to an air conditioning company, and they we learned very quickly on that we needed to be talking to a refrigeration company, a large-scale refrigeration. So I guess those would be my pointers is get it dark, get it insulated, and then talk with refrigeration people. Great. Thank you. And go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I'm. I we did the exact same thing, Jason. First time started out, we retrofitted a a, a big Home Depot uh, air conditioner, and then we had some problems with you know how things would freeze up. So, um, what we do, and I'll, I'll give you the the specs of our model is, if you're going to do 48, so decide how many bees you want to overwinter. Um, we did 48 eight frame kind of design criteria. Our units eight by eight by 12, so volume is important. So decide you know, what's the volume that you've got to refrigerate? We use an R40. So R40 will get you just about anywhere in the U.S. The building codes are changing. Um, and Kirti's research was really interesting that climate maps are changing. So are building codes. Um, but we found that you can do an R40 on all the different sides of a building and then do one air exchange per hour with a 7200 BTU refrigeration unit. So if you've got a shed that's kind of that size, or if you want to kind of scale it up, use that little rule of thumb um, about your insulation, uh, about your air exchange, and then your the heat loads coming off your colonies. That's going to be between 10 and 20 watts. So you can kind of scale up as you add more colonies to your uh, to your new shed. Great, thank you. Anyone else have anything to add about retrofitting? a building or just a key consideration when thinking about who to reach out to? I'll let you all think about that. Um, 
I'm going to take a couple questions from the chat. Uh, big, <laughs> big ass doesn't have lights listed in their catalog anymore. Excuse my language, but I do think that's the name of the company. Can anyone suggest alternatives? So I think the key there was those lights were super durable and watertight, right, Jason, so that the facility could be cleaned without causing any issues. So when thinking about an alternative, that's what you would want to look for. Um, and then for Jason, and may, this could also be for Brian, thoughts about not being able to divide an area into separate units. Yeah, I, I wish we had done that with our building. I wish we would have made partitions like what uh, Brian did. And, you know, I think we, we've looked at retrofitting it, just having uh, curtains you could pull across and partition it off that way. Um, and then, you know, the way that our refrigeration is kind of modularized around the building, we could do that. We just haven't found the use case to where we've got a clear defined use case in which we really want to do that. But I mean, we have some, it's just the amount of effort and cost to make it happen. But initially we should have done it. We should have partitioned or created, I, I like flexibility because I think as one of the mistakes we make sometimes is we build things for exactly what we're doing today. And then we go, oh, shoot. And so I, I like it to be really flexible. So if I was going to do it now, I would make um, some type of a curtain divider system, insulated curtains or doors uh, where you could change that configuration and you could really partition it in different ways because you don't know, you, know, you only figure out what you need and what you want to do when you start doing it. And so maximizing the flexibility, I think, is, is one thing that uh, I would suggest doing in that in that model. And Brian kind of showed in his building how how they did that with the different rooms. Yeah, Brian, maybe if you could comment on that a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Jason there. It's it's when you're building, you you have these ideas and then later on you're like, oh, but I've just done this, but I made this a little bigger. But um, for sure, for us, the division deal was it works out real good for us. And we kind of stumbled into that in a way. Uh, we just, when we were first putting it together, it just kind of made sense to kind of divide things off because some of the other things we wanted to do with the building. And then as we kept expanding, we kept just adding more refrigeration. So that's how we kind of end up in these, div these uh, divided rooms. But we really like it because I don't always need to run the whole entire building. I only need to run maybe two rooms. And so I don't have to pay the power bill to run rooms that I don't need. And as I think we explained in the video, if you lose power, you have a problem. You could always open a door and keep another room or we've even had to um, switch rooms for a, a reason, some reason or another. Um, but yeah, the curtain thing would be pretty good because then you give you more flexibility because there is plenty of times where I wish I didn't have a wall right there that I, a forklift just ran into, right? But, um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, if I was building again, today another room or if we were expanding it will still have div divided rooms it works really good for what we do great thank you and um ben i'm also curious working on a smaller scale if if that had occurred to you um any ideas on oh i wish i could divide this so i could use part of this space for activity a or part for activity b I think you're on mute. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Um, no, with a smaller scale, that really hasn't been a concern at all. Uh, these are just, you know, the size of a, a trailer. So um, there hasn't been any any other considerations. The only other uses I've used uh, had is off season, you know, um, rented it out for a, a peach, you know, a Palisade peach distributor, and, um, you know, other refrigeration issues or uh, needs, but I haven't had any any um any other uses come up uh, besides that uh, I, I would stress also uh, the point that Jason made was um, the the light issue you know this year uh, seems after a little bit of use there's a, a little crack you know in the uh, maybe in the insulation at the bottom of one of the doors uh, the bees are definitely more attracted to so even the, even at the at colder temperatures those bees coming out um, to die are just you know uh, which I'm not concerned about but I definitely noticed they were uh, piled up around that area. So, um, 
no, other than the renting it out off season, there's no other reason I can think of to partition a, a smaller unit. Thank you. And I, I might add one thing. Um, it, depending on what your work you're trying to accomplish, we need different temperatures still. So we might need two rooms to be really cold and then another room not to be as cold. So that's another advantage of having the partitions. Thank you, Brian. Taking um, another one from the chat and kind of in a, in a related vein, do you think AC buildings can also be utilized in the spring, creating a temporary brood break like Brian Ashurst described? It would be interesting to see an in-depth analysis done on how much it costs to cool a building that time of year and honey consumption of a hive on a commercial level, not only keeping it cool, but holding a high level of CO2. So a lot in that question. I would add too, um, I wonder, Kim, if you've had discussions about using your units as like a a mobile holding unit because you could imagine having them in staging almonds and put some colonies in there for like other kind of unexplored reasons that we haven't talked about yet, but could um, that would be potentially a really useful tool because you can just plug them in there, right? Yeah, we've actually been talking a lot about that. Um, if we found some holding yards that allowed just for some power sources, um, our units, because they are small, can go off of a, a 110 circuit, like a 15 amp circuit. So you could kind of gang them up if you had enough power in a holding yard, give you more flexibility as to when you release them out into the almonds or, you know, when a particular almond patch was blooming, you know, you could be a little bit more precise about, about that for sure. Great. Please panelists jump in to talk to each other if you're interested in in that. Yeah, I want to anyone with other thoughts on using these facilities in spring to induce a brood break. Um, um, I mean, I'll just say, I mean, yesterday, Zach Browning talked about the use of this in the spring, right, with his refrigerated buildings. Um, and so it, it does seem like it's possible. I don't think he talked about the, the power bill usage. Um, and then the only thing, <clears throat> I mean, about the high CO2 is you heard Jason say it's very difficult if you're having to bring in fresh air. Um, and I think over that short period of time, it may not it may not have the biggest impact um, on the but, you know, Jason has seen, you know, potentially some of that happen even over a short period of time. So I think um, I think it's possible. It's certainly possible to use AC buildings like Brian Ashurst is doing. Yeah, yeah I, I think what? oh sorry, I Brian. Think the, okay, I was just gonna say I think when the spring you also got to remember and consider there's gonna be a lot of brood in them. And so they're gonna eat more. And what you what we have seen is they kind of go in with we only put heavy colonies in and and they kind of hold their, their weight pretty good until that brood hatches and then they start consuming a lot. And so if you go a little too long, there you're gonna have starving colonies coming out. So I think you need to consider that in the spring and um and of course, you know, depending on where you're doing this at, it, it, the power, power is, you know, expensive in California and uh, you're going to have to consider that. We've even considered uh, mobile storage in the sense of, uh, you, you know, talking about the almonds, you could um, load them in vans and they already can start their cold weather down. You dock them into your cold room and put them in for, you know, the, the three weeks or whatever, but consider uh, all that brood's on there and, and those bees are going and they're hungry and they want to go. Yeah, we, we tried, uh, putting some in the spring and we just didn't have enough weight. I mentioned this yesterday. We didn't have them heavy enough. And so after just a week time, they were, they were too light, uh, and we had to pull them out. And so we'd like to try that again here, getting them a little bit heavier. Um, it, I mean, that 18 days that Zach was talking about is fantastic because then you have all your brood hatched off and a mite treatment would be extremely effective. Um, and, and, you know, what you guys are doing, Brian, um, we'd, we'd love to get there. We just found that the weight, the consumption was so high. Uh, for whatever reason, we were coming with big colonies out of the apples in Washington. And I think just it was a combination of too big of a colony with, with too little weight. But I think there's a, a huge potential there. Um, as far as CO2, it was asked too, like, why don't we hold it longer? 
we we have held it for longer it just came down to when the temperatures were really getting cold outside and we were burning so much if it was warm outside then you know we can hold it longer for not as a, an expensive power bill and um i don't know where that magic date is i think we should start bumping that up we just wanted to really dip our toe in and and see okay well, what if we do this for a couple weeks you know and start out with that and then maybe extend that and and so i think we're probably to that point where we just had cold weather this year and so uh, it's again, it's tough to with high winds and, and cold weather. It's one hard to get the levels that high in our building and two uh, rather expensive. And I guess the third thing I was going to tie back into that modular. One of the ideas, uh, one of my great business ideas that to rule the world that will never come to fruition. So I might as well just spill it out was I thought, here's how I'm going to make my millions. I'm going to get, you know, refrigerated vans and I and the new California idle laws make it so refrigerated reefer vans are only supposed to run for like five minutes until they get plugged in at the dock. So those those trucks, so semi-truck refrigerated vans, they pull up to the dock, they plug in at the dock, and then they go to electric power. And then once they get unplugged, the diesel kicks on and they refrigerate while they're over the road. Well, why don't I get a fleet of 20 of these things, be proof them, rent them out as modular you know, units, and, and then people will come and put them in my facility and we'll ship them straight to the almonds to them like it's an end-to-end -end solution and uh all you got to do is be proof and you know somewhat modify the refrigeration and then rent these things out and you can be at a really small scale you're only talking 300 hives so for much smaller beekeepers this would work and there's my private jet and island and that's as far as i've gotten with that brilliant idea so now Someone, you know, can go turn it into, I mean, Kim, you're, you're halfway there and there's probably reasons why, you I know, think we need to talk, Jason. I think, you know, we'll make everybody bazillionaires with this. <laughs> I was going to say, there's a question in the chat. Um, Kim, please tell us about your rental costs and mobilization and share any pictures. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if now's the best time to do it. Um, we want to keep chatting, but I'm happy to to either do this offline or, or throw a few up on the screen now, what do, whatever you think. I think it's okay. Let's see what we're we're talking about here. If you want to share your screen, I made you a co-host, so you should be able to. All righty, let's see. Kim, while you're setting this up, and Jason, have y'all ever thought about doing the modularized units for, like, are there applications for bee breeders for controlling mating and uh, controlling their populations and genetics. Yeah, we've actually been talking to, to, uh, to commercial bee breeders about coming up with a queen bank system. That's like a 20 footer that could be just used for queen banking throughout the year. So this little mobile pod um, wouldn't necessarily have to be cooled and heated for all your established colonies, but you could use it as a queen bank. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then local genetics. A lot of folks are interested in keeping their bees local and not kind of moving them across the country or even establishing a breeding program. So, yeah, we're super excited about those possibilities. Great. While Kim's getting her pictures, uh, I, I can ask Ben, so does that open at both ends? Like every time you open it, are you starting over in your contained environment? It just seems like that would, it's such a small area to to open up. Uh, no, it only opens up, up on one end. Uh, there's a, a double doors on one end. And uh, like I mentioned before, there's um, originally was built with uh, slides. Um, there's, there's a picture of my shop there that just Kim, Kim just put up so you can see the doors in the front there. Um, and then the pallets uh, are just set on the on the, sli uh, the the sleds and rolled back. Um, but I uh, recommend that we just get rid of those and put in some uh, metal flooring and I can just slide the hives back in, in there to get into there. So there's a nice um, uh, head space over the top. So you can, of course, open the doors when it's, you know, it gets down below freezing here in Colorado. So you can just, open it up and take a look inside and see how things are doing if you want, but, um, and crawl in there if you really felt like it. <laughs> but uh, other than that, I, don't, I haven't had any real reason to, um, for, to get to gain access to the hives, except just to take a peek now and then to see how they're doing. But um, with the um, 
with Kim's um, monitoring controls, you know, anytime, um, you know, if something goes wrong, it'll text me or email me. So I, uh, the biggest thing I have to admit is, is the less stress. Absolutely. Put them in there, close the doors, walk away. And I'm not fretting all, all the time, you know, wondering if my bees are going to be okay. So that's the, I have to say the worst thing about <laughs> almond pollination there is, is how your bees are going to look come January, you get back out there and open them up. So anyhow. Yeah. And something's always going to happen on like Christmas Eve or Christmas. So Ben, I'll probably be talking to you then. We always get some weird storm or power outage. Um, so that's one thing to consider with uh, any of these buildings or any, any modular system or even your own system is who's going to respond when you get a big storm or you've got a problem. Um, yeah. So anyway, this is, this is a quick drawing of the new version. This is what we're headed to this coming year. It's, um, it's lighter weight than your standard container or connex because it's not all steel. It's insulated to R40. We've got these double doors on the side. And as Ben was saying, we're going to be kind of using his uh, skid steer skills, which are, which are pretty impressive, to just push these colonies back in there. Um, this is showing 48 double deeps. Um, and yeah, some of the other uses that we're finding, similar to the bigger facilities, you can store your drawn cone in there. Ben was able to store some peaches, and maybe this year we'll find some other produce from the community gardens around us. But also we've got heaters in here if you want them and you can use it for preheating your supers or even using it as an extraction room if you're kind of a smaller operator. So that's a, an image of what is to come this year. That's great, Kim. Thank you for sharing that. And I see that George has his hand raised. So I'm gonna allow George to talk if you wanna ask your question, George. Well, I, I just, another use uh, that we're considering is we, we make a lot of nukes and sell them. They're in cardboard um, disposable uh, boxes. And we're, we're selling them to all different kinds of people who don't ever seem to quite get it that you have to pick them up at um, some time when the bees aren't flying or, you know, or whatever. They just show up all the time. And so we were thinking that if we um, had the nukes made up already and had them in a cool storage, it wouldn't have to be, we just have to be cool enough to keep the bees from being active. And if we had people come in the middle of the day, we could just pull out what they were buying, you know, plug them, plug the entrances. We've just found that when those uh, units are out in the rain and or whatever, they're just people coming and needing things at an inopportune time. And this would give us some, um, some flexibility in being able to serve their needs. So uh, just a different idea. And it would be in the spring, I wouldn't think that the energy um, required and the temperatures wouldn't be required to be as low as what you would do for a brood break. We just wanna keep the bees inactive for you know days, two, three days maybe, or a week at the most. Yeah, I think Ben did some packages. Yeah, actually, um, what George talked about, I, I did exactly that this spring. Um, I sold about 150, 200 nukes, um, and it did make my life so much easier. I could just go out early morning or the night before even, uh, the day before, pack up my nukes that I knew the guys would be picking up the next day, um, throw them into the, into the unit, and um, just leave them there. And even if they didn't come the next day, I was like, okay, whatever, you know, they're still sitting there and they're just fine for a couple of days. So, um, and for a couple of times, I just, you know, I was like, well, I think I'm you know, going to need, you know, 20, 40 this in the next couple of days. So I just load them all up in there um, and leave them there. And I didn't have to worry about it and have to go out and close up nukes all the time or uh, go out to the yards and get them. I just had them all prepared and ready to go. And so the, uh, um, you know, the manager in my shop, you know, could just come out and everybody, oh, I heard my nukes ready or my nukes ready. And they just pop in. I'm like, yeah, actually, we have uh, we have a nuke right here in the cooler for you. So um, that did make our life a lot easier. We did try to um, put some packages in there. I put about uh, what was it, 300 packages or something in there to see if they could keep them cool. But um, unfortunately, it just uh, over overloaded the the refrigeration unit in there, but um, I do have a my workshop. It's it's uh, you know I kind of designed it for the same purpose was to be able to put my uh, packages in there to keep them cool and spray them down and um, you know because sometimes in late April in Colorado it gets over seventy and 
um, kind of wanted to keep the packages from want to keep them, you know, clustered instead of you know, running around in their cages. So, um, yeah, it, it worked fantastic for my new distribution. So it definitely made my life a lot easier there. Wow, that's great. I'm just blown away by all the different uses people are finding for these facilities, whether they're big or small and whatever you can do to help with the cost and the initial investment and make that make sense over time. Um, from the chat, Tim Hyatt, researchers, what is the ideal range for humidity in overwintering hives, regardless of indoor storage? What is it in nature? Is And is controlling humidity worth the equipment cost? I'll just go first. I, you know, cause I can't answer the whether it's worth the equipment cost side of things. Um, I know refrigeration itself has the ability to remove some of that humidity. Um, the, there's not a lot of research specifically on humidity. I think, you know, people have reported anything from like 45% to over 80%. Um, I, I think, I think getting over 80% should be of a slight concern and probably over 90%, you know, could be a real concern, but, uh, it's something that we're battling right now with our cargo containers. So they're at 80% right now. And I'm, asking the refrigeration guys if there's something we can do to bring that down just a little bit just in case but um, that's that's kind of all I know about the humidity issue thank you Brandon go ahead does anyone have anything else to add about humidity or the cost controlling humidity yep Kim uh, and I think Jason touched on this about a uh, desiccant dehumidification system yeah, the costs are just, um, you know, maybe something at the scale of, of Jason's buildings make a lot of sense to do dehumidification, but so many systems dehumidify by adding heat into the air. And so now you're battling that dehumidifier. So if you had a desiccant based system, which was more of a material that absorbs humidity um, and scattered that around, um, you'd still have to empty it out. But I think that might be worth it. Um, or you need to look at an inline humidif dehumidifier that's external to the building that as the air is coming in, it, it's able to dehumidify that air. Because anytime you drop the temperature, your relative humidity is just going to start going up anyway. Um, one good thing about the, the storage units is that the honeybees are actually going to be creating kind of this ball of warmth around them. And what you your your condensation may be happening more on the interior walls than where the honeybee is, you know, it's kind of the cluster is within their their hive boxes. So if there's a cooler temperature around, it's going to condense on the cooler surfaces rather than in your colonies, is what we've found. But it's it is really, really pricey. Great, thank you. All right, I see. We, um, I, I guess on dehumidification, the, the only thing that um, our building typically sits between 60 and 70 percent humidity. Um, and that's just the humidity that the that the refrigeration pulls out. Uh, but early on, it'll be above 80 percent. And that's where we really struggle with the equipment to keep up. The quote I got on a dehumidifier to run the kind of numbers that we were looking to pull out was over one hundred thousand dollars and required massive power. and. Uh, but yeah, it, it essentially exhausts the wet air out. So it draws the wet air of the room in, dries it and blows it back into the room and then exhausts the moisture out of the building. Um, but it does introduce some heat to the building. And yeah, it was over $100,000 for a dehumidifier. So it, it was uh, not going to be cheap, but I think it was propane fired. So again, you know, another utility cost. But, but uh, if there was, I think, research that really pointed to you know, obviously the equipment would benefit a lot from it, but we don't know. Sixty uh, percent has we haven't had any humidity problems with mold or um, you know moisture condensation happening throughout the building, but that's kind of where we usually sit is sixty to seventy percent. Yeah, I will add that your location, where you are in the world, matters a lot. So if you're in a drier climate like Colorado, you know we can bring in fresh air and our humidity. You're even in cold storage isn't going to get more than in the sixty percent. The further you go into those more humid climates and you're introducing more of that humid air, it's going to be, um, that's going to be your struggle. 
Great, thank you. And of course, those are some of the challenges with research as well and, and trying to collate this information for beekeepers as so much of it depends on your region and those, those crucial differences. Um, I think I see one that was for you, Jason. Would a reefer keep up to a semi-load of bees? I bet that would press the limits or if the cooler malfunctioned, you'd have a dead load. Maybe that was more of a comment than a question, but. Yeah, I did run those numbers. I mean, it's been a while about, you know, how many BTUs they pull out uh, when they're on electric versus diesel and, and kind of ran the numbers on how many we could put into there and then how you have to, we found that you know bees get into every crack of, of equipment when exposed. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that refrigeration side to keep the bees from you know getting into it in a in a van because they're probably going to be flying a little bit when you first put them in. And Brian touched on how much work it is to rinse bees out of his defrost pans and and other places. So uh, you know, it's the things you wouldn't think are our struggle often turn into the struggle and bees getting in places where they shouldn't be and clogging up uh, air returns and getting into light fixtures and getting into sensors and getting all those places you don't want them to be. Um, but yeah, the reefer, um, it did look like the capacity was up. And as I mentioned, what I thought was really innovative is if you could bring these electric diesel combos all I would need is a big yard of, you know, 30 plugs that they're plugged in most of the time. And then when they're ready to hit the road, you just unplug them, they fire up on diesel and, and go over the road. Um, malfunction and redundancy was an area that I, you know, looked at and really didn't ever get anywhere good because you're looking at one unit and a single failure point is not a place that I like to live in beekeeping. So yeah. one of the many issues. Redundant. Yeah, we ran the numbers on those reapers as well. And, um, you know, they might get to you to about 100 colonies. One of the challenges that we found is that they supply air low. So rather than supplying air high and having it fall, a lot of those systems return high and supply low. And that's where we were struggling to get, you know, all the dead bees and all the kinds of like lower um, hive boxes out of the way to get really good airflow. Great, thank you. And I see a, a comment here too from um, Barry. Thousands of bee colonies moved this way in Australia from Queensland to South Australia to almond pollination and macadamias in August. Sealed curtain side trucks with a reefer on top. So it might be happening in some places and we can all learn from each other. Um, a few other comments. From Phil, red LEDs are better than incandescent. And from Linda, we built a movable bulkhead door to partition off part of the conics. So another way of partic partitioning a building there. And then Jason, this is for you. What is the outside ambient temperature, temperature average where your AC runs the least? We rely on nature's fridge in Canada, negative 30 overnight this weekend. I wonder if it would be possible to spike CO2 without AC. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you didn't draw in fresh air, you just cooled the air using the outside. It's one of those times that having a really well insulated building actually hurts because it's co way colder outside than it is inside. And so if we wanted to keep the building cold, um, you know, I think if you had some sort of geothermal cooling, you could do all that without uh, it be still cheaper than than running full refrigeration. Uh, we just don't have a way to bring in. It's either refrigerating or it's bringing in outside air and very little fresh air is going to plummet those CO2 levels. So uh, once we start drawing in fresh air and like I mentioned, that's at around 30 degrees. I think I mentioned that outside. Um, about 10 degrees colder than set point. So if we're trying to maintain a 40 degree building, we start drawing in fresh air at 30 degrees. And I won't get too much into the why behind that, but uh, you don't want to be drawing in fresh air if it's only one or two degrees cooler than your uh, space temperature. You want to be quite a bit cooler, uh, 10 or more degrees cooler outside before you start using that to refrigerate your space. Great, thank you. I'll just add, I mean, so in our research things, we are supplementing CO2. So we have, you know, a giant tank of CO2 to, to, to have a tighter control over those levels. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's expensive, right? And so, I mean, it's just another expense to add to it. Um, 
um, but it is possible to add gases to it. You know, and in the tree fruit industry, they use, you know, they flood the these controlled atmosphere facilities with nitrogen, for example, and uh, to replace the oxygen levels and, and manipulate the environmental room and their very large chambers. So it is possible to adjust those metabolic gases. Great. Thank you, Brandon. And I see Martin has their hand up. So I'll ask you to unmute Martin and you can ask your question. And maybe while we're waiting on Martin, um, from Anthony Antonucci, and this might be more directed at you, Brandon or Danielle, you can jump in here, but how, how much and what kind of research is being done to wintered hives stored in these facilities? Has any of this research changed the way these facilities are to be set up and run? Thank you. I hear Martin got his microphone on mute. Go ahead and ask your question and then Brandon and I'll come back. Sounds good. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. I have no question. That was a mistake. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries at all. Thank you for joining us. All right, back in the hot seat, Brandon. Okay, yeah. I don't, I mean, directly, I don't know that we research how these buildings should be set up best. I think the industry guys have done a good job of that. Like Jason has kind of said, there's, you look at everything that's available, but there's nothing that says exactly how you should set it up for your use. Um, I think, you know, especially because it's hard to do research on building, you know, like you can't design a 15,000 square foot building one way and another 15,000 square foot building another way and research how it's best. Um, so I think it's, these kinds of things are great because you get to hear from folks that have their buildings set up in different ways and learn from what they did um, right and what they would do differently and things like that. So we've been looking more just at the, you know, the health, um, the care of the bees, you know, the setup before they go in and then the environmental conditions in the building. And hopefully you saw Gloria's work yesterday, you know, as far as these decision-making processes for like treating for nosema before storage and those kinds of things. And I would say that um, there's a lot of interest. This is a very quickly growing practice and the research is trying to keep up. We need more capacity. Bren is doing as much as he can. Um, and the Tucson lab, we have Gloria here. Uh, William Michael is here, Vanessa Corby Harris, like that lab is doing a lot to understand uh, what's happening inside the bee to, to coordinate with what's happening out in that storage unit and in the field. So uh, I invite anybody from the Tucson lab to jump in and say more about what they'd like to do next. But certainly there's a lot of questions that we'd like research to address. And until then, beekeepers are doing a great job. I mean, Jason, you did a fantastic job looking at all of these questions in a methodical way. So um, I think that's the value of bringing together discussion with practitioners in addition to some researchers. Yeah, and I'll add, you know, it really, it depends a lot on like Brian's building. My building would be horrible for Brian Ashurst application and, and vice versa. And so um, one thing I think would be a cool guide, a good PAM thing would be, you know, you've got queen breeders who want to use these buildings for certain things. You've got um, some of the brood break opportunities that, that can be done. You've got overwintering and something to kind of, I guess, uh, best practice or things that uh, you see in all buildings, things that work really well for this type of, you know, practice to happen in it. Maybe there could be some type of a guide that would help discuss the various types of uh, layouts and refrigerations and designs that that people are, are doing. You know, um, a group, like I say, that went around and looked at all the different buildings and kind of took some of the best things for each, but there isn't a one size fits all that this is the best building. And so here's exactly how, you know, it should be done. There's just so much variability in this industry and what people are doing and what your outfit looks like and where you're located and a lot of factors. Jason, it sounds like you'll get your private island as a consultant if you share <laughs> your knowledge with folks. Maybe easier than bee refrigeration trucking. 
And I would say that Pam, you know, we don't do this ourselves. We have resources to put into it. So when we have a good idea, like the, the guide that, that Brandon has developed the content for and Gloria contributed, we're looking for people that say, well, I would like to produce this. And they'd probably be coming to you, Jason, and you, Brian, and Kim. And like, here's, here's the information that we can get and put into this resource for beekeepers to learn from. So Pam's next request for proposals is in January. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Gloria from the Tucson lab. Is there any other, every, anybody else from the Tucson lab? Um, oh, hi, Gloria. This is William. I'm, William, uh, is there anything you want to share first? Do you want to go first? Uh, no, you go ahead. Well, I'll just quickly go. We, Pam, uh, the Project APSM did fund a study. We uh, conducted a two-year study, and we were able to construct a small experimental facility here for working with cold storage. And we're looking, we've been looking at, my work has been focused on um, individual B measures, but mainly colony level measures inside cold storage versus outside cold storage and trying to understand how the cold storage can be optimized and what different uses it can be put to. We've been using it for brood break as well as uh, overwintering just to see how the hives behave in these different sorts. It actually winds up opening up sort of a new field of things because of course, temperature and CO2 has got this daily cycling going on, and it continues even in a situation that's completely dark and um, without uh, changes in daily ambient temperature. So anyway, take it away, Gloria. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks to Project APSM and William, uh, we do have our own cold storage facility here that, that works really great and, and enables us to do a lot of things right here on, on site. And with William's uh, ability for with his continuous monitoring, uh, we're able to get numbers on uh, um, what's going on in a hive and, and maybe translate them to, you know, what the bees are doing. And um, we have some, some, you know, questions that, about, you um, what takes what makes a bee go into uh, become a, a winter bee? And we have some ideas about that that uh, we want to uh, pursue. And then also what gets them uh, rearing brood while they're in cluster? Because that brood that they rear while they're in cluster is their cushion for, for uh, spring dwindling. And the more they can rear, the more of a cushion that they're going to have. And so we take colonies out of cold storage facilities and they'll have a frame, a frame and a half of, uh, of brood in. Now we're taking them out to go put them in almonds. Um, those colonies, by just looking at the brood, you can count back as to when the queen started laying, right? And so um, she starts laying around the end of January. And so then, well, I should say about the third week in January. So you know, you got 21 days, those new bees are just coming out when the almonds are blooming and so you got no cushion you know but the more that they can make the more brew they can make the better but what, what exactly are the triggers for that and then we have a big project with with Washington State and Brandon and Kirti and uh, folks at Michigan State and folks at Penn State that ultimately and this is all part of the grand challenge we want to develop a, a zone map for when to put colonies in cold storage particularly, you know, these are like Northern latitudes. Um, so that, uh, because we, we have envisioned colonies, you know, beekeepers across the country needing this tool with the way that the climate is, is going to be changing, the way it already is changing, it's getting increasingly difficult for East Coast, Midwest, as well as us West Coast folks to overwinter colonies out, outside and, and get good results. And so for the peace of mind that Ben, you're talking about, you know, uh, of putting them in cold storage and, and not worrying about the 60 degree day that you get in December, <laughs> sometimes in, in places like Pennsylvania, uh, that um, you put them in cold storage. Uh, but when do you put them in cold storage when you're in those latitudes? And that's what we ultimately hope to develop. Thank you so much, Gloria. Yeah. I um, would like to call on Barry, who has their hand up, if you would like to ask a question, Barry. Thank you. Um, just to say, um, firstly, uh, on behalf of anybody who's ever listened to this over the years and benefited from the information, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I, I just would like to make sure that 
I'm understanding, um, just observing <clears throat> um, in Canada, specifically, uh, it's, it's a common practice for beekeepers to bring bees in for the winter, as opposed to leaving them in permanent apiary sites. Um, I don't think I understand all the reasons it's done, apart from the fact that um, there would be some sites that would be not ideal to leave them out for the winter, so we bring them in or they're brought in. Um, following this research and other research, it seems like with climate change, just bringing bees in for the winter um, and relying on the drop in temperature in Canada to justify bringing them in so that you can keep them cool so they don't stress or fly out of the box. I, am I understanding it right that the research is starting to point toward the fact that if those bees have flown since Labor Day, and all the winter bees are now nice and energized because of our warm falls. Are we starting to put less and less the quality of bees away if we're just waiting for drop in temperature to justify indoor wintering? It's a great question. I, I'm not on the panel, but can I? Can go, I go ahead, I, I, Gloria, I think, please. Yes. You're, you're spot on with that. It's it's ironic, you know. Beekeepers in Canada put colonies in cold storage to get them away from the harshness of your of your winters and the and the winds. So we put them in because our winters aren't coming as early as they used to, and our bees are flying too late in the fall. And then sometimes they'll even you know you'll you'll have breaks in the winter time where the temperature gets above fifty degrees and they're flying for several hours. And when bees fly, they age. So, and when you model all this in a, in a uh, population model, you see the age structure of that colony is uh, uh, getting corrupted. And so when they do start flying, for example, in almonds or, or whatever in the spring, you have all these old bees dying, Jason was talking about. But you have so many of the old bees that there's not enough bees to make new bees. And there's that tight relationship between number of bees in the colony and how much brood they can rear. And they start a downward cycle. They can't rear enough bees to get it, get them out of it because there aren't enough bees. And so uh, that's yeah, that's why we put them in cold storage is to 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 make winter come earlier for us. So so for those for those folks who have got uh, good assets and had been successful in overwintering, that they're they're on their way indoor wintering. But it seems to me like it's a smart investment now to retrofit those buildings with refrigeration. So that we can bring, you know, we can chill those bees down to four, three, four, five degrees Celsius by October 1st, arbitrarily. Or as I, as was said yesterday, which was in, it's so interesting to me to put them into storage with cat, with cat brood. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think the research you're doing is very valuable. I think the, the translation of that, um, you know, above the 49th here is, it's going to be very different than down in the US where you're using it for different purposes. But um, I've observed it now for many, mm, several years, certainly on my own, um, that they're not going, they sit, <laughs> they sit on this concrete apron waiting to go in because the weather hasn't dropped. Well, those bees are all aging and you're putting less and less quality colonies away. Great. Thank I'm sorry. You. I think, I, I'm sorry. I think I interrupted Brandon earlier. No, you didn't. And actually, I'm glad Gloria jumped on because I just was saying, you know, I didn't want to put her on the spot, but I thought she was the perfect one to to answer that. And so, I yeah, I appreciate the question, Barry, and I think your observation is spot on. I think the bees are, get to a certain point and, you know, in October, they're not going to get any better. And so there's no point in allowing them to fly and rob each other and spread disease and, and age and all that. Um, and that being said, you know, I saw we have plenty of cold in Canada and this comes up a lot. I, when we've done this, whether the bees do better in these storages or outdoors, if they're outdoors in the cold, um, they do okay. They've done that for you know hundreds of thousands of years, but it's, I think that refrigeration and the indoor storage gives you that consistency and stability. So you don't have to worry about these swings of if you're in Canada, minus 30 degree days and um, up to 60 to 65 degrees days in Colorado or Southern Idaho and stuff. So 
I think the dependability and stability is very helpful and you don't have to worry about it from year to year, week to week. So that's a big advantage. Thanks, Brandon. And I see a few more specific technical questions coming up in the chat, but we're getting towards the end of our hour and I want to make sure every panelist has a chance to just give a final word or impression or, or how people can reach you before we wrap for the day. So um, any any thoughts of what you want other beekeepers to know about either your technology or indoor storage or research? Um, and we'll start with Kim. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, well, you can certainly reach me at um, our website. If you have a contact through the website, I'm the one that goes to. Um, you can also reach me. I can pop my contact mess, uh, email here in the chat for everybody. Um, and I guess my, my last parting thought is that there's so much great energy and research moving towards this um, that I'm excited to see where it goes. And I, so thanks for including me. I learned so much today, um, especially from all the folks who have these large buildings and all the kind of experiences, both in like warm climates and cold climates. We're all adjusting to new normals. And um, so thanks. Thank you, Kim. And and Ben, we'll go to you next. Yeah, um, you can reach me um, through my website as well, kapokoshoney.com, or uh, Monday through, uh, what is it, Monday through Saturday, 10 to 6. You can just call our store in Fort Collins, leave a message for me. And so I am pretty easily accessible. But um, <clears throat> I, it is a good question, that last question about when to put them in there, October, November. Uh, our experience you know, with the other beekeeper down a little further south in Colorado was uh, five months storage in there versus my four months, you know, she had massive amounts of dysentery, uh, you know, and she put them in in October, I put them in mid November. So um, maybe it was because I fed the, sh the sugar syrup and she didn't, I don't know, but that is a good question of, and maybe somebody has a good answer to that, of when is best time to put it in there, uh, put the bees in there. So I'm glad that research is being done uh, down there in Tucson. Um, and then that, um, yeah, this is uh, definitely some definitely good uh, potential in indoor storage and I think in modular units for, for sure. Thank you, Ben. And I'll go to Ellie next. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in and thanks to Project APIS uh, for putting this on. Uh, we're, we've been working in bees for over six years now uh, with commercial beekeepers, but we're definitely new to cold storage and I've learned a lot today. Um, and we're excited to continue to be a part of this community, helping research how these hives change over time, different ways to configure in cold storage. And if we can be a way of um, Moving that research forward, I'm very excited to be in the space and excited to see researchers I respect a lot here too, uh, as well as beekeepers. So I really appreciate everybody sharing their thoughts and I'll drop my email in the chat as well if folks wanna talk with me. For folks that are in Canada and internationally, we work internationally too and would be glad to help you all with your cold storage needs and assess some of these research questions we've been asking here in the US. Great, thank you. And Jason, any final thoughts? Yeah, um, I don't want to be found, so I'm not going to share my contact. <laughs> info. I'm, I'm a recluse. I'm a beekeeper. I you know hide in bee yards for for a reason. Um, but no, I think I think the the really exciting frontier um, that I can foresee is this really large scale varroa. Like, there's perhaps uh, we're close to an opportunity to kill Varroa at a coordinated large like way that whether that's going to be through fumigation of something, whether that's going to be through, um, you know, high levels of, of certain, just the ability to take all of an outfit and know that it was treated uh, uniformly in a very systematic way, all the same, take the labor and the unknown out of, I think that we're at the cusp of hopefully something kind of exciting with and and I think that these indoor buildings and indoor uh beehive will be part of that key you know maybe not but I I certainly think there's a big opportunity there and I hope that we're able whether that's Brandon um or whether uh, and and you know his work on on CO2 or some other avenue 
I just think that it would be such a huge breakthrough for the industry. And I think that the idea that all of the hives, you know, can be put into one controlled atmosphere and then treated in one uniform controlled way uh, would be, you know, beyond huge. So I hope that that's where we kind of see some, some breakthroughs come in the next few years. Great. Thank you. And, and Brian, any final thoughts? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd say thanks to Pam for putting this on and all that. Appreciate it. I always learn something new at these, at these uh, talks. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, I think for anybody considering this, um, there's different ways it can be done. And um, I, I, I think, you know, look at your area, look at how good your bees are at certain times of the year. You wouldn't want to put weaker hives in this in the fall because they're not going to survive. So look at all your different factors. And But I think there's a, an opportunity for everybody to use this as a tool. And Jason touched on it a little bit there, and it's my control. I think there's a good opportunity in there for us in, in different, different uh, configurations. Um, you need another tool in your toolbox anyway to keep control of this uh, Varroa problem. And so, yeah, I definitely would be interested in, or I would, if I was looking for ways to keep my bees safe, look, look into this. There's, there's a definite uh, future into uh, cold storage. And uh, anybody's got any questions, you can, we have a website, ashersbees.com. Just look us up. You can find us that way. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. And, and I think I'll kick it to, to Brandon or Danielle to close us out. Yeah, you got. I mean, you guys covered it all. I'll let Daniel close us out. I think that's great. Thanks. Well, we're on the hour. Um, I think this has been really valuable, and I just thank everybody. I think it's a brilliant idea to now that we're trusting that we can put all our eggs in one basket <laughs> to make a next step and maybe do a, a, a coordinated treatment. That's that's always been kind of a holy grail in in IPM. If you can treat everything at one time, then everybody gets a benefit. So that's a brilliant idea, Jason. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. This is an incredibly busy time for all of us. Uh, I think it used to be that we had downtimes and it just turns out now we're traveling for meetings and uh, it's busy. So thanks for sharing your time. I hope it was the, the benefits outweighed the investment of time and we really appreciate it. And I, I'm seeing a lot of comments come in that people appreciate it too. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have ideas about what you'd like to see in the next event or the next indoor storage guide, please put those in the chat. We're listening. Pam gets a lot of great ideas from these kinds of things. So, uh, so put them in there. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone. Thanks guys. Thank you. So.